Episode 166, Crime and Punishment, 5. The sack was wide open. What came out of it was a face, the face of the person Vikir loved. And the moment I saw that face, Dolores couldn't help but make a blank expression. There's no one there, right? Yes. The inside of the sack was empty. Nothing. Without anything. Dantalian then became even more embarrassed. Nonsense. I heard that humans are animals that live with love. No, not only humans, but all animals have the feeling of love. But what about you? But Dantalian's words did not last until the end. Pow! This is because Bakir's sword, which appeared as he lifted the black hilt, fiercely dug into his chest. Gasp! Dantalian took a step back, pouring out black blood. All thirty-six faces were distorted as they witnessed the unbelievable situation. Could it be that the magic wasn't activated? Could that be why no face came out of the sack? But unfortunately, Dantalian's hopes were dashed. The magic was activated normally, and the resulting enormous mana consumption and the enormous recoil damage caused by the destruction of the magic came as a burden to Dantalian's body. Moreover, Bakir, who had fallen into the arms of Dantalian, who was defenseless due to the use of magic, continued to inflict fatal stab wounds with each step. Puff, 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 puff. An aura so thick that it feels like a solid continues to pour in. It pierced through flesh like the teeth of a wild beast, breaking bones and tearing through internal organs. The aura that bubbles up through those teeth sticks in and eats away at even the soul. Even if it is the body of a devil, it is no business. Sierra. Dantalian hurriedly retreated, hugging his belly, which had instantly become tattered. Blood, flesh, and pieces of internal organs were dripping down, covering the floor like asphalt. Nonsense. Does it make sense that humans have loved no one throughout their lives? Well, there is no such person. Yes. Here. Vikir answered briefly and dryly. Vikir, who was always taught to suppress his emotions since childhood, grew up straight and not crooked. In some ways, it may have been a kind of crookedness that made the straightness worse, but I didn't know that at the time. A killing machine that was completely devoid of all emotions and operated solely by orders. Dog of death. That was Vikir van Baskerville in his previous life. A time when everything was fleeting and dying. Was there room to love a hunting dog whose emotions had all been worn out and dried up while crossing over 500 firing lines? big and small. Was there someone who could teach you love? And Dolores, who was watching from behind, could vaguely guess what happened to Vakir. It was because of the phenomenon of soul resonance, the smell of life felt the more Vakir opened up his energy. In the process of praying, healing, and buffing for others, priests empathize deeply with their souls. So, we are influenced by those emotions and sometimes assimilate them. Dolores recalled what she had once heard from the night hound. Theology is the study of understanding people. At the time, I didn't fully understand the true meaning behind these words, but now I think I understand why. At this moment, Dolores was empathizing and empathizing more deeply with the emotions and situation of the night hound than anyone else. What kind of life has he lived? How heavy a burden is he carrying alone? How long has he continued his solitary and lonely struggle? Until recently, she had known that the Night Hounds were terrorists. The newspaper club he was a member of even gave him a the villain name. But no. He was a fighter who fought against the evil of this world before anyone else. A prophet who was persecuted by the world, not understood by anyone, and loved by no one throughout his life. How far ahead is he standing and looking forward? How lonely, how difficult, how painful, how hurt it must have been. Suddenly. Warm water moistens the area around my eyes. As a human being, Dolores wanted to stand behind him, or even next to him. Rather than just following the path he took, I wanted to walk alongside him and become his strength. Like the legend of a priest who went on a long journey along with a warrior to subdue the demon king a long time ago. I wanted to stand next to him and hug and comfort his wounded soul as much as I could. I wanted to hug my torn feet on the thorny path in my arms. I really wanted to hold the hand that was cut by the knife. I wanted to let you know that you are never alone. But. 
Dolores also knew. The night hound is never one to rely on others. He will never give his side to anyone else. There will be no leaning or relying on it. I will forever stand alone and move forward. Even if it is a thorny ascetic path, a single path filled with blood and flesh. Dolores, who was able to understand this well due to the temporary and partial assimilation of the soul, could not help but feel even more sorry. Deep down, he knows that the person he wants to lean on will never actually lean on him. However, is the heart of a woman who knows but has no choice but to wait so painful, sorrowful, and sorrowful? However, there was another painful and sad person here besides her. Qua. Dantalian. He is really sick and sad. This demon lord, who had only known how to sit in an arrogant posture and laugh at humans, contorted as many as thirty-six faces and screamed. And Vikir grabbed Dantalian by the hair and kept stabbing him here and there with the knife without letting him go. Once a hunting dog bites, it won't let go. That's how I was educated. Vikir was steadfastly attempting close combat even though his body was being torn apart by the waves of mana emitted by Dantalian. Cool. You damn bastard. Let's see if he can stick it out like this. Dantalian picked up a random fragment of Vikir's memory. In Vikir's memories, filled with only cold, sharp fragments. If you get it wrong, it's so dangerous that even the devil Dantalian cuts off his hand. It felt like digging through a bag full of blade fragments and glass shards. Shit. What kind of person would live such a life? Dantalian risked his hands becoming rags and picked up the one fragment of memory that still had some warmth in it. The face changed with the intention to stimulate Vikir's love for family in its own way. Look. This is the face of someone who once cared for you. Can you still stab me like this? After all, it was set less Baskervilles. Set had been training in the closed pipe for so long that even the people in his family had forgotten his face, so Dolores could only tilt her head when she saw him. Who is that? A handsome man with white skin, dark eyebrows, and a somewhat cold-faced appearance. It was a handsome face that caught the eye, but the lack of blood on the skin made it feel somewhat creepy. Is this person related to the Nighthound? But Dolores didn't have time to carefully examine and remember Set's face. Thank you. For giving me motivation. This is because Vikir's reaction was much faster. When I look at Set's face, the sadness I felt before returning grows even stronger. So what could have been stabbed once could be stabbed twice. Puff. Puff puff. Puffufufufu. Set's face explodes from the barrage of slashes. At the same time, Dantalian's entire body began to break into smaller and smaller pieces. Kwaoeoa. A terrifying baptism that cuts away even the soul of the devil. At that time. Ugh. Don't bother me. One of Dantalian's many faces changed. Appears to be in his early teens. Beautiful blonde. White skin. A girl whose slightly droopy eyes look somewhat sad. The old, crude gold necklace around her neck can be seen with the word Nymphet written on it. Moment. Vikir paused. Dantalian didn't know why Vikir had stopped, but he thought now was his chance. Get lost. Countless faces stick out their purple tongues and shout. Dantalian, like the devil of speech, sticks out his tongue like a blade. But. Grumble. Dantalian's attack failed again. Dolores, enraged upon seeing the Nymphet's face, once again intervened in the battlefield, scattering white flames. I said I touched the wrong person. As soon as Dolores had burned the tip of Dantalian's tongue, she ran to stand next to the Nighthound. In moments of crisis, she becomes even more confident and cool-headed. Vikir tilts his head, not knowing why Dolores has suddenly become so brave. Soon, Dolores looked back at Vikir and spoke bravely as if she had decided on something. If you're having a hard time, lean forward. I'll wait any time. The moment when Vikir tilts his head again as if he doesn't understand what's going on. Fa. The white light that Dolores emitted just now soon dwells in Vikir's whole body. At that moment, both Vikir and Dolores felt it. Resonance of the soul. It is a feeling similar to that of companions walking together on the same path and interacting with each other. 
it was literally the type of relationship only possible between soul partners. And the moment it happens. Flash. The light emanating from Dolores' body exploded nearly ten times. Awakened Saint's buff. And it had the greatest impact on the saint's soul. The only being who can make a saint awaken. Those who possess a soul of the same amplitude. The Hound of the Night. He is the one whom Saint Dolores recognized as her soul partner. Whether it is consciously or unconsciously. Ah. Dolores felt all strength drain from her body. Divine power exerted with all his might to the point where he could not even stand. The buff of immense power that was released in this way was absorbed into Vakir's body. Dolores has tremendous divine power thanks to her natural talent. Since it exploded ten times, the resulting buff couldn't have been a normal buff. The moment Dolores' buff takes hold of your body. Ugh. Vikir felt that the wall that had been blocking his head had been torn through in one fell swoop. The high and solid wall that seemed insurmountable for a while collapsed, and the realm beyond came into view. Sword Master. The Realm of the Supreme. It was the moment when I ascended to the rank of Superman. Episode 167, Crime and Punishment, 6. The moment Dolores saw the face of the nymphette created by Dantalian, she felt something in her mind snap. A string of reason that I always held with a calm attitude. The moment it was cut off, she fell into an incredibly irrational and emotional state, and those intense emotions completely brought out powers she didn't even know she had. And that emotion and power flows towards one person. Vikir. Hounds of the Night. Vikir, who received the buff that Dolores had gathered and delivered to him by gathering his soul, witnessed the opening of a new world above the realm he was originally in. Sword Master. The aura amplified within the body spews out through the blade of the magic sword Beelzebub. Quack 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 quack. From gas to liquid and from liquid to solid. The aura, which has boiled to its limit and hardened, gradually becomes more solid, like a lump of blood coagulated by heat. And it began to rotate in a circle according to the laws of mana. Keying. The solid aura overlaid on the sword rotates at a high speed that is almost invisible to the eye and circles around the blade. It looked like countless logging saws gathered together and rotating. Whying, ga 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 gag. When Vikir lightly swung his knife, the debris such as rocks and rebar in front of him was cut off with sparks flying. Just touching it lightly is enough. Truly crazy cutting power. That's huge. Even Vikir, who was calm about everything, was deeply surprised. Is this the master? Did Hugo always feel this way? Since you have reached the level of master, the bottom is so far away that you cannot see it. I felt like I was starting to understand why Hugo had been treating his subordinates like flies. Even in his previous life, Hugo went up two levels from Sword Master. It will soon be revealed that Sword Master also has low, middle, and high levels. Vikir temporarily became a low level Sword Master with the help of a saint from the highest level of graduator, and from now on, he planned to keep this feeling engraved in his body. Later, you will have to get up here on your own without any buffs. Meanwhile. Quaya. Dantalian's entire body was being torn apart alive. Vikir was cutting fragments of the aura rotating at ultra-high speeds onto Dantalian's body and cutting them here and there. Beelzebub, a magical sword that looks like an awl, was mainly used for stabbing purposes, but not anymore. Rather, the rotating form of the aura was even more specialized for cutting, but that did not mean that the stabbing power was weakened. Apart from the explosive increase in combat power, what is this sense of elation? I feel like I can do anything. Vikir was in an unusually good mood. The resonance of the soul, the arrangement of the buff as if it were made by knowing the size and location of the internal organs and blood vessels of the entire body. It was an excitement that felt like an extension of the feeling of wearing new clothes that fit and fit well. Dolores' divine power was spreading warmly throughout Vakir's body, accelerating the flow of mana. Blood vessels expand and blood and mana flow more quickly. The amplitude created by the aura's trembling also widened significantly. This is the result of the soul resonance phenomenon. And Vakir knew something about this phenomenon. Yes, before returning, Dolores, the saint of steel, only applied this buff to a few nearby heroes. 
At the time of the Annihilation War, there were only a handful of beings who could receive Dolores buffs. Dolores treated everyone without any discrimination or distinction, but only used buffs carefully. Only a few great heroes who had the power to maximize her buff effects were able to receive Dolores buffs. Hugo Les Baskerville, the head of the Iron Blood Sword family, and Morg Camus, the head of the House of Morg and famous for his nickname Empress Dowager, were among such heroes. But what about now? Vikir is the only one receiving Dolores buff. It meant that Dolores recognized and understood him deep in her heart, but unfortunately, Vikir did not know this. I just thought I was lucky. Meanwhile, Dolores felt as if her body and the Night Hound's body were completely merged into one. It is a feeling that not only the body but also the soul is mixed. Even though it was a temporary phenomenon, she received great comfort and sympathy during this process. I've never heard any particularly warm words of comfort from the Night Hound, but somehow I feel like he's embraced my fatigue and feelings of inferiority. She often thought about this. Everyone in the world confesses their sins to me and expresses their worries then, to whom should I confess my sins and vent my concerns? Sometimes just talking to God isn't enough. There are times when you want to talk to a fellow human being. But in the meantime, Dolores was unable to tell anyone about her psychological stress. As Dantalian said, she had to always appear dignified and resolute as someone's president, someone's manager, someone's saint, and someone's daughter. But she took this opportunity to blow away all that sadness and loneliness. And he pushed all his emotions towards the wide lantern in front of him, the night hound. Tonight's partner, soul mate. Quack 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 quack. Wow. Bikir pushed Dantalian with a force that was incomparable to usual. Dantalian, who was suffering from lacerations after being caught in the saint's holy fire net, could not withstand the sudden surge of Bikir's aura. Soon, Bakir stretched out his knife and tried to cut off Dantalian's neck. Dantalian's head with numerous faces close together like grapes, and the slender neck that connects the head and body. At that moment, Dantalian made his final move. Brother. Help me. Nymphet. Her face turns towards Bakir. Is that all? The faces of all the children in the orphanage cried out for Bakir. Brother. I can still live. If this devil dies, we die too. Brother. Please. Please don't kill this demon. This murderer. What happens to us? And Dantalian's plan seemed to be working at first glance. Vikir's sword has slowed down, albeit very subtly. And targeting that moment, Dantalian used all his magical power to launch a soul dive. Quack. Dozens of Dantalian's tongues came together to form a single spear, which struck Vikir directly in the heart. Vikir couldn't even scream and was thrown from the spot, breaking two stone pillars and being buried in a pile of debris. No. Dolores cried out in horror, but it was already too late. Dantalian lifted up the blood-covered body and smiled darkly. Ho 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 ho. Normally, in a fight between experts, there is only one move short, which leads to a meaningless result like this. Soon, he approached Dolores, who stood with a blank expression. Creeping, creeping. The face in the front changes back to that of a man. A middle-aged man with a solemn appearance. It was Cardinal Humbert, the head of the Old Testament faction. Daughter. This father is so disappointing. I sent you to the academy to raise the family's prestige, but you're causing trouble like this? Was it okay to go around talking about your family's wealth to the world? Soon, Humbert's face contorts into an expression of contempt for something pitiful. I thought you were a better person, Dolores. Then Dolores' small and delicate body began to tremble again. Night Hound It was because the Night Hound was by his side that he was able to overcome the image of Humbert that had previously popped out of the sack of fear. But there was no hunting dog to save him now. She crouched down, losing the confidence she had before. It's like trapping yourself in an eggshell. Chiak. Soon, Humbert's face opens its mouth wide. The mouth, which had no lower jaw joint, opened infinitely, turning into the maw of a huge snake. Dolores in an eggshell, and a snake trying to swallow the egg. Dantalian tried to devour Dolores with a wicked smile. 
Now, offer your face to me rock. But Dantalian's voice cut off midway. Pow! Hot blood splattered black. A blade approaches without a sound or presence and cuts off Dantalian's neck. Before he knew it, Bakir was standing behind Dantalian with a cold gaze. Uh, how? Obviously, the heart. Dantalian with the face of a nymphette stammers a question. Instead of answering, Bakir opened the inside of his black cloak and showed it to him. Jeek. There I saw a black sphere with incontinence. Madam Eight Legs Egg. That is what protected Vakir's heart from Dantalian's spear. Although the shell is slightly broken, it is still a strong madam's egg. Vakir put it back in his arms and looked at Dantalian. I don't really have anything to say. Soon, Vakir completely cut off Dantalian's head. Go to a bad place. That was Dantalian's last. Tuck. Tutuk. Digur. Dantalian's faces fall to the ground and roll on the floor. But. Brother brother I'm so sick. Dantalian's legacy still remained. Arms and limbs slowly regenerated beneath the nymphette's face. It crawled on the floor and tried to run away. However, Bakir blocked his way. With an unwavering gaze. Sigh. The last blade pierced the exact center of the nymphette's body. Only then did the nymphette's movement stop. She raised her eyes as if they would close at any moment and spoke in a voice that seemed as if it would break at any moment. Thank you mister. Then and only then. Bikir's gaze wavers. Bikir cautiously bent his knees and cupped the nymphette's face. Then the nymphette lifted her collapsing body with difficulty and wrapped her arms around Bikir's neck. Sighed. And then he lightly kissed Bikir's cheek. Tsutsutsutsu. Eventually, everything disappears. All the darkness disappeared, leaving only the debris in the ruins. Dolores' palm came closer and wrapped around the back of Vakir's hand, who was sitting still. Nighthound are you okay? Even though she had struggled with Humbert's welcome just moments ago, she was the first to check on Vakir's well-being. Right then. Landing. The metallic sound of something falling through the cracks of the collapsed stone pillars rang out. Vikir and Dolores turned their heads at the same time. Sparkle. A brightly shining golden necklace. Nymphette. It was a letter engraved so hard that it hurts the eyes. Episode 168, Crime and Punishment, 7. The next morning. The entire Indulgentia orphanage was in shock. Buildings completely devastated. But for some reason, everyone who slept through the night testified that they heard nothing. It was as if it were a dream. Naturally, the whole world went into an uproar. In the ruins, where countless people had been busy coming and going since morning, the students of Colossio Academy who had come to volunteer were standing in despair. No, what kind of situation is this? It is truly amazing. Why didn't we hear anything while the buildings were collapsing? Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy were looking around with blank expressions. Now they were going back to the academy, but for some reason, they were not moving easily. It was only natural that the place where I stayed and did volunteer work for the past ten days was devastated. At that time. They said the night hound came this morning. It's scary. While everyone is sleeping. Bianca and Sinclair appeared. Students who came for volunteer work talked about the terrifying villain who attacked this place last night. They think that if they had done something wrong, they could have become the target of that murderer. What a waste. It was an opportunity to catch that guy and prove my qualities as a great hero. Seeing as he hides behind a mask and only goes out at night, he must be a petty thief. As long as I can get my hands on it. Hey, guys. Still, wouldn't it be a little scary? How many people have already died at the hands of that villain? What are you afraid of? As soon as you show up, I'll hit you with one shot with my arrow. I think he's a villain worth researching because he has a lot of interesting points. Everyone seems excited. Meanwhile, while the puppies were gathered together and howling. Academy students will now return to school. Please gather in one place. And those of you from Quo Vada Street, please come here separately. 
St. Dolores was restoring destroyed buildings and counting the casualties. Surprisingly, despite the early morning disaster, no one was killed or injured. However, the remains of boys and girls around the age of 13, which were commonly found in all the places visited by the night hound, were discovered in large quantities. That is right below the lodgings of Quilty, the head of the Indulgentia family. Numerous reporters came and covered this tragic scene. The same was true for the members of the Academy's newspaper department. Dolores did nothing to stop their reporting. Rather, it seemed to be a subtly encouraging attitude. Meanwhile, Quo Vadis sent an investigation team early in the morning. Young New Testament priests came to diagnose the children's health and thoroughly searched the scene of the disaster. Priests from the Old Testament faction also tried to inspect the scene. The saint has not yet reduced your investigation. Mosgus, the archbishop and inquisitor of the New Testament faction, was blocking the Old Testament investigation team. Some clergy members of the Old Testament sect protested. Aren't we the same quo vadis too? Are you discriminating based on faction? Old Testament clergy also have the right and duty to investigate the scene of a disaster and save their neighbors in difficult situations. Archbishop Mosgus. Holy woman. What nonsense is this now? Get out of the way right now. If I report this to Cardinal Humbert, he will immediately issue a big disapproval. But Mosgus just shook his head, blocking their path with his huge castle-like wall. Eventually, Mosgus looked back at Dolores, who was out in the middle of the scene in the distance, and said. Saint. Please go back to school now. I will take charge of this place. Yes, Mosgus. Please. They were conversing as if they did not care about the Old Testament clergy. Dolores placed her hand on Mosgus' arm and whispered softly. I'm sorry about what happened to you, brother. Although they were twins, they were raised separately from birth and were not particularly close. Moreover, our beliefs were very different, so it's okay. However, the expression on Mosgus's face as he said those words was deep. He seemed greatly shocked by the fact that his older brother was used like a puppet under the name Ephibo. Quilty, or rather Dantalian, and the four undead he was commanding were completely destroyed and thrown deep into the collapse. Quo Vadis will now begin a large-scale investigation into the truth. Mosgus looked around the excavation site and spoke in a low voice. Quilty he was a man who was suspicious from the beginning. The night hound still seems unreliable, but at this point I can't help but trust his sense of smell. Attacking the family's tribes was an unforgivable act in a way, he is cutting out the rotten parts of the family in an amazing way, so personally, I am grateful and feel relieved. Mosgus, that clumsy principled man, even said something like this. Mosgus had also seen how hard the night hound worked to provide relief during the outbreak of the Red Plague, so even though he said this, he was deep down friendly with him. Dolores nodded. Archbishop, please sort out the situation here. Yes. Are you going to school right away? No. There is one thing left to do. Which? In response to Mosgus' question, Dolores just smiled. Suddenly, Mosgus realized that Dolores was much more energetic than before. Before, the image was that of a teenage girl who was strict and firm, but behind the scenes was conflicted and troubled, but now. You have become even stronger. As if she had shed a layer of skin, she was shining brighter and more vibrantly. The face also had a strangely refreshed expression. As expected, Dolores felt much at ease due to the soul resonance phenomenon with the night hound last night. Although it was only a temporary phenomenon, it was a very pleasant and uplifting experience to merge body and mind with someone. Dolores listened to the sighs, sorrows, and sorrows of people around the world, but was unable to lament her own feelings. She was very excited at the thought of being understood by someone for the first time and being comforted by someone for the first time. Is that why? Quo Vadis everyone. Everyone pay attention. Dolores was the one who boldly pushed forward with things that she normally would not have been able to do because she was worried and worried internally. Soon, the eyes of the Quovadis priests all turned to Dolores. Volunteers from the academy were also giving a puzzled look. Gulp. Dolores swallowed once. Quo Vadis, a religious hymn. 
a prestigious family of priests whose entire family is affiliated with the Rune Church, and who have been helping the government and conducting ceremonies as a family of priests for a long time since before the founding of the nation. What she was about to do from now on could be an act that shatters that noble pride. However, she also had strong beliefs. If you truly have pride, you will overcome this too. Her last night with the Night Hound had changed many things for her. Dolores no longer watched, hesitated, and worried to herself. The world that criticizes, pressures, and forces her is no longer scary. Saint. Why on earth are you stopping us? Please join us in the investigation. Can you discriminate like this just because you are an Old Testament believer? Aren't we all brothers and sisters under Rune? Dolores. If Cardinal Humbert knew about this. Dolores stands in front of the screaming Old Testament clergy. Fluttering. She took out several sheets of paper from her chest. A stamp attached to the envelope and letters containing the recipient and sender. Even the seal of the Indulgentia family. It was a letter sent from the Indulgentia family to the Quo Vadis family and handed over to Dolores last night before the night hound left. Use it where it's useful. He disappeared without saying this. Soon, Dolores began to read the documents she had taken out of her arms. January 0 th. Sales details of indulgences and indulgences. Her voice was trembling slightly, but it never broke. Sender. Quilty Rune Indulgentia. Addressee. Cardinal, Humbert Humbert Alquavadis. Both sides of the letter Dolores is holding are crumpled by the force. Indulgence sales statement. Viscount Bicoin, instead of passing on the inheritance to his children, he murdered his parents who said they would donate it, faked their death as an accident, and stole their inheritance equals absolved of all sins by paying 1.5 billion gold as an offering. Baron Legesso, terrorized and murdered twin sisters who were working as maids, and secretly buried them in the sewers. All sins were forgiven by paying 200 million gold as an offering. Lord Finigate, murdered his partner and took all the investment money, and the partner's family committed mass suicide after suffering in their daily lives. All sins were forgiven by paying 800 million gold in cash. Count Isil, suspicion of large-scale tax evasion, tax evasion amounting to nearly 100 billion gold equals all crimes are forgiven by paying 300 million gold as an offering. Corker CEO, accused of manipulating stock prices, driving more than 10,000 ed investors to commit suicide equals absolved of all sins by donating 5 billion gold. It was a secret ledger containing details of the indulgences Quilty, or rather Dantalian, had sold to nobles and merchants who visited the Old Testament festival. Tax evasion, stock price manipulation, sex crimes, contract killings, arson, assault, parricide, etc., all kinds of illegal, criminal, immoral, and inhumane acts. Conclusive evidence that the Old Testament sect of the religious him quo vadis was closely involved in all kinds of dirty crimes was exposed to the world. This is the saint of the Quo Vadis family, done by her own hand. Episode 169, Crime and Punishment, 8. The Old Testament Clergy Protest Against Dolores. Saint. Do you even know what you are doing? The deceased Quilty was a devout member of this church. How can you carelessly read a letter he left while he was alive? It's not even a conversation with Cardinal Humbert. It's confidential, confidential. If you arbitrarily reveal something like that to the public. They seem to be afraid that the credit would be taken away by the New Testament clergy. They say a crisis is an opportunity. In these situations, treating the sick and comforting the affected residents is a way to strengthen your image. Therefore, the Old Testament clergy wanted to be quickly deployed to disaster recovery sites. That was the reason why the New Testament clergy, including Dolores and Mosgus, were dissatisfied with the fact that they were blocking it. But their dissatisfaction did not last long. Quiet. When Dolores' cold gaze met them, they froze in place. This was the first time that she, who had a warm and caring personality, gave me such a cold and sharp look. Isn't it said that when a person who is originally gentle gets angry, it becomes more scary? The Old Testament clergy all had to stop in front of Dolores at a single line she drew. And as she continued to read, everyone's complexions began to turn blue. Baron Gorg. 
In the process of exercising the right to first night, the groom who resisted was killed. Subsequently, the family of the priest who committed suicide was found guilty and a huge fine was imposed. As a result, the family broke up. Exonerated by donating one billion gold. Viscountess Mosk. He gets his sons hired at the Imperial Central Bank through improper solicitation and gets them promoted. Because sons with underachieving grades joined the company in droves, there were many job seekers who failed despite receiving passing grades. This too is absolved by a donation of 200 million gold per son. President Gereso. Through embezzlement, breach of trust, and stock price manipulation, shareholders suffered about 20 billion gold worth of damage and made unfair profits. Exonerated with a donation of 50 million gold. Madame Pierre. Kidnapping and confining underage boys who have nowhere to go, sexually exploiting them and forcing them into illegal labor. Exonerated with 15 million gold donations. Mani Mani, the cult leader. By intentionally spreading the plague-stricken believers in all directions, they make the people anxious and paralyze the local economy. Exonerated with 100 million gold donations. The extent to which Quilty recklessly sold indulgences was revealed. Serious sins that can never be forgiven are listed in a row. And most of the money paid for the crime was a very low price compared to the nature of the crime. The heart of a human being. How can someone wear the clothes of a saint while wearing a human mask and forgive something like this? It was so shocking that even the Old Testament clergy who were protesting could not believe their ears. You sold indulgences to those devils. And at that price? No way. There are probably four or five zeros missing at the end. Especially the cult leader Manimani, isn't it enough to burn him at the stake? I cannot believe it. How could Cardinal Humbert and the Quilty family do such an ugly thing? There is such a thing as absolution. B but the seal on that letter is definitely. The whispers did not come only from Old Testament clergy. The agitation spread beyond the people of Quo Vadis to the general public. How could the Quo Vadis family do this? What a corruption of religious hymns. Calm down. That's the problem of the Old Testament faction. It has nothing to do with the New Testament priests. Do not drive away the Old Testament priests. That's just a problem for a few tribes. The whispering gets worse. The priests looked as if they were about to get into a fistfight among themselves. In the crucible of confusion, Dolores finished reading the information provided by the Nighthound. The materials include the transactions between Quilty and Humbert, the ugly reality of those who claim to be the leaders of society, traces of using donations offered to God as investment funds, details secretly leaked for political funds or illegal lobbying, and even false accusations in each region. Traces of collusion with religion were written in detail. In addition, there were traces of selling pitchforks, pieces of wood, straw, and even pig bones that would have been used in a farmhouse as sacred items. There was an agitation and a plan to exempt one year of purgatory for each sacred object, and the number of sacred objects sold in this way was already exceeding 30,000. The public who learned of all these facts was shocked. The Academy's boy and girl reporters also stopped writing down and make blank expressions. The terrible scandal of the religious hymn Quo Vadis was made public by a young saint who also belonged to Quo Vadis. In response, Dolores continued to shout out the rebuttal she had been thinking about all night. I, Dolores of the New Testament faction, refute these atrocities of the Old Testament faction as follows. Once again, the public's pen stands upright. The sound of scraping on the notepad continues to echo. The mana screenshots floating around were also exploding with flash. Dolores began her speech with a resolute voice. First. When our Lord and Teacher Rune says, repent, he means that the believer's entire life must be repented. Second. These words cannot be understood as sacramental penance to Rune, that is, as confession and atonement performed under the authority of a priest. Fifth. The Pope has neither the power or the will to forgive any punishment other than that imposed by his own authority or by the authority of church law. Sixth. The Pope has no power to absolve any sin other than to declare or admit that the sin has been forgiven by the Lord. 27. It is only a human theory to say, 
as soon as the money thrown into the treasure chest makes a jingling sound, the soul comes out of purgatory. 45th. We must teach the rune believers that anyone who ignores a poor person and gives money for their absolution is not absolving the Pope, but rather incurring the wrath of rune. 46th. Those who do not have abundant wealth should be taught to believers that they have a duty to save what they need for their families and that they should never waste it for the sake of indulgence. 51st. The Pope should teach the Runians that they must repay the many who have been robbed of their money by certain creatures of indulgences, even by selling, if necessary, all their churches. 90th. To not resolve the objections raised by ordinary people with valid reasons and only suppress them with power is to make the Pope a subject of ridicule and to make the rune believers unhappy. 95th. In this way, let the Runiists have deeper confidence in entering heaven through many sufferings rather than through comforts. She read the rebuttal, which was as many as ninety-five articles, fluidly and without stuttering a single word. The spirit was so great that even the opposing Old Testament clergy were moved, so there was silence for a moment during the session. At the same time, Dolores felt her legs relax. It was fortunate that the loose white skirt characteristic of the priest's uniform covered the tremors. Mosgus, who was next to the saintly woman, supported her. That was a wonderful rebuttal, saint. Every word is correct. Mosgus was very moved. I'm out of my mind. Dolores recalled what happened last night, or rather, this morning. Hounds of the night. After he left, the energy that had made his body strong and strong disappeared like a lie. I was speaking bravely just now, remembering the overflowing energy at that time, but in reality, that was just a psychological factor, and the power itself had long since disappeared. The Pope once said this. She is a saint and she can only awaken when she meets her true soul mate. Resonance of the soul, assimilation of emotions, and resulting explosion of divine power. In layman's terms, this means that you gain the ability to multiply your power. What should we do to ensure that this awakening ability continues, rather than just being temporary? Now that the night hounds are gone, there is no one to ask or test. In the past, the naughty classical saints often spoke about awakening. At that time, I should have listened to it a little more carefully and not thought of it as meaningless nagging. Dolores still didn't even understand why the night hound could become her partner, or, awakening condition. There is no way for her to know that this is because Vakir is the only veteran who came from the age of destruction and knows the true destruction. Well, anyway. The man chosen by Rune. At this point, only he is qualified to be the saint's sole partner. Dolores raised her head once again. And then he opened his mouth quietly. The hound of the night. I really want to see him again. Right at that moment. Pop. 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 The sound of mana screenshots exploding in the background is loud. When Dolores turned her head in surprise, there were countless reporters gathered there, who had come so close. Reporters rushed to speak with one voice. The saint declared a holy war against the hounds of the night. Episode 170, Pet Pussy, 1. Exclusive holy woman, declare war on the hounds of the night. I really need to see him again. Last morning, October 0, Saint Dolores of the Quo Vadis family showed strong hostility towards the hounds of the night. As she bit her lip and muttered, her solemn expression was filled with a breathtaking war spirit. It's the night before the storm. The results will tell whether the night hounds or the Quo Vadis are sloppy. Meanwhile, some are claiming that there is a possibility that a holy war may be declared because Dolores, who usually uses euphemisms in a gentle tone, rarely used such stubborn and strong expressions. Various newspapers began to be distributed. The volunteer group that returned to Colosio Academy was surprised to read an article in the Academy's evening newspaper. Wow, the article has already appeared. We were there at the scene of this history. Hmm. The manager declared a holy war. It didn't seem like that kind of atmosphere. I think the article went too far. Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy looked at the newspapers and each said something. Bianca and Sinclair who were next to him also nodded. Well, that's what reporters are like. You have to write provocatively because you have to increase the number of views. Brother Vakir. What do you think, brother? 
When Sinclair asks, everyone turns their gaze in the same direction as her. Vikir was standing behind him, a little distance away from the group. Vikir walking quietly while reading a newspaper article. The atmosphere is lonely and sad without knowing why. Why is he in such a mood? Hey, aren't you coming? Then I went first. When Bianca opened her mouth in an annoyed manner, Tudor next to her tapped her side. Hey. Are you inconsiderate? What? What kind of consideration? How is Vikir feeling now? How do I know how he feels? TSK TSK, you inhumane bastard. He's the same as ever. Tudor slowly turned his head and looked at Vikir behind him. Then he turns his head again and looks at Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair. That guy, Bakir. You peed in front of people yesterday. Yes. And on top of the manager's body. The amount was huge. Ugh, it's really dirty. My brother must be going through a lot of trouble. Now. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair each picked up a word. Finally, Tudor nodded. Vikir, you probably want to be alone right now. But. I think it was the same for me. Hasty consolation can actually be poisonous. Maybe you could pee. The guy is timid. Do you think we'll start a rumor? No, no matter how bold you are, it still bothers you. Sinclair looked back at Vikir behind him and muttered something regretful. I'm okay with my brother having to pee. Of course you'll be fine. Because you're not cheap. Tudor patted Sinclair on the shoulder and spoke to everyone. Ruler. Everyone understands, right? So let's leave Vikir alone for a while. Piggy, how about you sleep in our room tonight? Please leave him alone. Huh? Is that okay? What can't be done? Let's go do some iron work together later. Thank you, Sancho. Piggy also seemed to have become close to many other friends through this volunteer activity. The guys naturally moved away to give Vikir some alone time. Meanwhile. Are you guys going first? That's a good thing. Vikir glanced at the crowd of classmates in front of him and slipped off to the side street. Dalkak. Vikir returned to his dormitory room alone and sat quietly at his desk. A small wreath and incense were placed on the desk. While the incense was burning, Bakir said a silent prayer over the garland. It was a morning for an imphet. Aren't you being too kind to the kid? Did you get a kiss? I didn't receive it. It's not, not, it's in. The kid wants a kiss like that, so get some. The conversation I had with the saint at the farewell party flashes through my mind. If I had known it would be like this, I would have waited and gotten a kiss. Bakir frowned slightly. I have to hunt harder. When the era of destruction arrives, countless innocent children like Nymphets will die. In order to prevent that, there was a need to hunt down demons even more diligently. We will kill both the demons and the traitors who became their limbs. In order to do that, I guess I should check the harvest, right? Vikir took something out of his arms. They were black leather sacks obtained from Ephipus, Hebe, Pedo, and Geronto, respectively. Each of these sacks, with purple veins fluttering beneath the black leather, seemed to be alive. I put them all together. This. Vikir's eyes opened slightly. It was one big mask. A large-sized mask that looks like a combination of a bandana and a hood. There are two sharp protrusions on the ears, as if the scalp of a Doberman had been cut off. And Vikir already knew the identity of this Oparts. Is it? Is this what you can get here? A mask radiating an ominous aura. It was a relic comparable to the demon sword of Beelzebub. Mask of human faces, picaresque slash mask. Brotherhood plus zero. Human face water heart off. Bakir closed his eyes and recalled information about this artifact. A long time ago, I saw it in an oriental journal of all things. Is it a mask whose power becomes stronger the more it kills its own people? If a human were to wear this mask, it would become a devil's mask that would become more powerful the more humans it killed. 
I also heard that this mask has mystical powers and that when worn, it has an inexplicable level of recovery in mana accumulation. Although I heard there were some side effects. Vikir decided to try the mask right away. Fluttering. Let's shake off the mask and put it on our head. Vikir felt his body changing. His body and stamina, which were in tatters from the last fight with Dantalian, began to recover rapidly. It was at a level completely different from that of a bog salamander. This is really amazing. The bog salamander's regenerative ability was excellent at regenerating a broken body, but it was unable to recharge physical strength or mental power. But this mask does it. As long as you use this, you can completely relieve your fatigue at any time. But. There was one problem. What? Vikir was shocked when he realized that his body had become noticeably smaller. Nuclear 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 dash. When I quickly turn my head towards the mirror, I see a black dog, a ball of black fur, panicking in the room. This is me. Vikir was surprised to see himself transformed into a dog in the mirror. There is a saying, when you drink, you become a dog, but that is only used figuratively. In addition, humans worse than dogs, humans worse than dogs, humans like dogs, etc. It's all just a metaphor. But Vikir himself has now become a real dog. Shiny black fur, sharp teeth, cute eyes, and even pink jelly on the palms and soles. This is truly a puppy dog. Seo, is this really a side effect? Oh, no. I tried shouting it out to myself. Grunt dash. All that comes out of the throat is a sound like a puppy would make when it wants to poop. Mask of human faces, picaresque slash mask. Brotherhood plus zero. Human mind susim, human face susim, on. The condition of the relic is a little strange. I felt that something that was off had changed to on. Vikir hurriedly touched the area around the neck with his front paw. Fortunately, traces of the mask still remained. When Vikir showed his will to take off the mask, it fell from the flesh and skin and slithered away as if it had will. Mask of human faces, picaresque slash mask. Brotherhood plus zero. Human face water heart off. Off again. And soon, Vikir, who had regained his human body, stood naked in front of the mirror again. Vikir laughed as he looked at the clothes peeled off on the floor. It would be nice to take off my clothes in one go before washing. Once again, I come to my senses and put on the mask, and this time it doesn't turn into a dog. Seeing that on and off are clearly distinguished, it seems that the mask can change when the wearer wants and not change when they don't. Vikir took off his mask and kept it well. It's the ability to turn into a dog whenever you want. It's probably closer to a sub-ability rather than a side effect. In the future, when working as the night hound, the ability to turn into a dog seemed to be very helpful in many ways. Not only will your recovery ability be greatly improved, but it will also be useful in escaping from others. Let's see, was it possible to raise a pet inside the academy? Fortunately, there was no rule against keeping animals inside the academy dormitories. Many students raise owls, pigeons, turtles, hamsters, etc. However, it was not possible to raise animals large enough to cause damage to the surrounding area, which meant bears or elephants. Just then, Bakir was looking at the book containing the dormitory rules. Pop. There was a sound that caught Bakir's attention. The sound of something small and insignificant breaking. Bakir turned his head to see something. It was a sound coming from a coat hanging in the corner of the room. When I searched my pockets, I eventually saw something surprising. Madam Eight Legs Egg. This black sphere was becoming more and more incontinent. Oh, now that I think about it, it was this guy who blocked Dantalian's spear in the end. I knew that it was unexpectedly hard and bouncy, but I had no idea that it would be intact even after blocking the devil's spear. But now that I look at it, it looks like it wasn't all that fine. Pop pop pop. The eggshell was gradually breaking. Even the mother, Madame Eight Legs, dissolved her eggs with acidic saliva and ate them. She was that strong against shock. Vikir looked at Al with a new expression. Yet. Wow. The eggshell was completely broken. And the thing inside opens its eyes for the first time and looks at Vikir. 
the Kier tilted his head. Inside the broken egg shell, you can see something chewy that looks like a piece of burnt bread. It was a creature I had never seen before. And as soon as he woke up, he also saw Vikir for the first time. When Vikir tilts his head, the guy also tilts his head and imitates Vikir's actions. Vikir was a little nervous. Although it looks small and insignificant, this thing is clearly the offspring of Madame Eight Legs, who reigned as a nightmare of floods. Didn't Vikir almost die several times while trying to hunt that giant spider? But. Surprisingly, this dust-like thing jumped straight into Vikir's arms. Then, he pressed his face into Vikir's arms and started making really unexpected noises. Wolf Nuke Nuke Whisper It looked like a newborn wolf cub. Episode 171, Pet Pussy, 2 Vikir closed his eyes. And I remembered a former enemy with whom I once risked my life. Madam, 8 legs. Risk level, S. Size. Location of discovery, Red and Black Mountains, Part 10 Ridge. A.K.A. Madam of Flood. The detailed species name is unknown. Among the most vicious beings that inhabited the depths of the deep hell in the distant past, there were spiders with incredibly large bodies, and Madam Eight Legs is presumed to be a distant descendant of those large spiders that lived in ancient times, preserving their form as is. Its entire body is filled with disgusting poison, and its mesh, which is stronger than steel, cannot be cut by anything except the hellfire of the world. Even Vikir of the world was a dangerous, high-ranking monster who almost died several times during battle. This giant queen spider found it difficult to deal with even the ancient demons that ruled hell, so they secured an independent space for them to live in a corner of the depths of the abyss. And now, before Vikir's eyes, is the last descendant left behind by that fearsome spider. Kuienji, Kyung. A round lump of dust that rubs its cheek in Vikir's hand. A guy with fluffy fur that sits or walks on two legs that protrude half-heartedly like scribbles. Madam's young. Madam Cub, or Madam Cub. This small, insignificant guy was now making white spittle stains on the back of Vikir's hand. If you look at what he does, he looks like an innocent puppy. Is it because a wolf hatched and raised it when it was an egg? This is why they say prenatal education is important. I felt like I could somewhat understand why pregnant women are given foreign language lectures and classical music to their babies from the time they are in the womb. At that time. Sticky. Vikir discovered something interesting. White, sticky mucus had begun to drip from the area where the baby madam had licked just moments ago. As soon as it touches the air, it hardens into a thin thread. Is this a spider web? It's incredibly hard. Bakir tried to stretch out the silk that the baby madam had spewed out of her mouth. Ordinary spider silk has a much higher tensile strength and greater elasticity than an equivalent amount of steel. Moreover, Madam Baby was a descendant of Madam Eight Legs, and the spider web she spewed was truly the strongest wire. Pop! The thread finally broke after Vikir pulled up a considerable amount of aura. This is a small amount of thread that was roughly pulled out. Are both elasticity and strength dozens of times greater than steel? It even has adhesive properties. Even though ordinary spider silk melts helplessly in fire, this one also has very high fire resistance. But. If it weren't for Cerberus Hellfire, I wouldn't have been able to cut off this spider web. Vikir thought, recalling the battle with Madame Eight Legs. Quick KKK panting. Meanwhile, the baby Madame continues to rub against the back of Vikir's hand. A movement that seems to be yearning for the affection of someone he has met for the first time, perhaps because he has no mother. Vikir suddenly felt sorry for the guy. Your mother was truly a scary monster. As I remembered the ravenous sight of the mother ruthlessly devouring the eggs she had laid, I thought that it would be much better for the baby madam to be separated from its mother. Well, anyway. Perhaps due to the imprinting effect, this baby madam follows the first Vakir she sees after hatching from the egg. At that time. Cough. Madam baby fell on the back of Vakir's hand with a sullen expression. Are you hungry? Nuclear nuclear nuclear. A cloud of black dust that becomes sullen. It looks like a piece of shoe that the baker accidentally burned to black. By the way. What should I feed this guy? Should I feed insects? Or meat? 
Bikir took out from the drawer some biscuits, a lump of salted ham, and a slice of cold spinach pie. These were all things that Piggy bought for a late-night snack and gave to Bikir. But. Omni Omnium. Madam Young did not enjoy biscuits and ham very much. It's just given to me out of courtesy. He even spit out the spinach pie as soon as he put it to his mouth. He's a tricky guy. Vikir made Madam Baby sit on the back of his left hand. Good. The guy sat on the back of Vikir's hand like a wristwatch. It was a perfect wristwatch with two legs wrapped around the wrist and holding it. Good night. Let's go find your food. Vikir immediately went to visit the dormitory. But there weren't many places to go. First, the library. It's a good place to get information. Vikir left the dormitory, crossed the playground, and headed toward the library. As you pass through the large front door of the library next to the park and enter the lobby, the huge library that Colosio Academy boasts comes into view. The endless high bookshelves were filled with all kinds of books. Vikir went to the nature slash creature slash monster section and started looking for a book. Spider Spider Go. As Vikir was looking through the shelves one by one. Oh. By your brother. Two round eyes can be seen through a gap in the bookshelf across from me. When I turned my head to see something, I saw a girl with white hair looking at me and smiling brightly. Sinclair. She hurried forward, turned around the corner of the bookshelf, and walked towards Vikir. She looks like an innocent puppy. If she had a tail, it would be wagging furiously right now. This is my first time seeing you come to the library. Hmm. It comes often. It's my first time meeting you. Are you here to study? Or borrow books? Sinclair, who asked that question, had a tag on his chest proving that he was a librarian. Vikir asked, thinking it was okay. Are there any books about spiders? Oh, I wonder how to kill a spider. That's right, if you search for pest extermination items, they come up all the time. Why? Is there a spider in your room? Hmm. A spider appears. At that time, Bakir felt his left wrist trembling. Aring. Madam Baby was frowning with her roughly drawn scribble-like eyebrows, making an angry expression. They even make noises to appear threatening. Vikir corrected the question by slightly hiding his wrist behind his back. Not getting rid of spiders. We are trying to find a way to raise spiders. Ah, spider breeding. There are books related to that. Let your older brother raise you. Do you like spiders? I don't really like it. Vikir was about to reply casually, but then stopped and looked down at his left wrist for a moment. There, you can see a piece of burnt bread looking up with tearful eyes. But I think it will get better from now on. Okay. You like spiders, brother that's interesting. Sinclair keeps looking back at Bakir with a curious expression. Her questions continued until she found a book on how to raise spiders. Hyung, why do you like spiders? Is it because you have a lot of hair? Have a lot of legs? Is there a lot of snow? So you also like centipedes, millipedes, grimas, and scorpions? How about something like a beetle? Do you like all kinds of insects? Oh, spiders are not insects. Vikir thought, she's a girl with a lot of questions. I don't think I originally had this chattering image. I thought he was a quiet and quiet person who only studied, but I was a little surprised. Eventually, Vikir borrowed some books and went out to a quiet place. Let's see. How to raise spiders. Vikir slowly turned the pages. Control of temperature and humidity is important it is susceptible to mold there is no need for lights be especially careful when removing the skin the molting period varies from individual to individual toilet training is done with patience and repetition they are easily influenced by their surroundings. So pay attention to prenatal care and early education from the time they are eggs in the case of large spiders, it is good manners to wear a muzzle when walking. Most of the stories are extremely common sense and general. Hmm. It says to give small insects or pieces of meat as baby food. Why isn't this guy eating? Vikir tilted his head as he looked down at the baby madam on his left wrist. Growling. Even at this moment, the baby madam was lying in a sullen posture. 
at that time. As Vikir turned the pages of the last book, he noticed something. Some extraordinary spiders that only appear in myths grow by eating poison during their infancy. Taking poison? Vikir turned the back page. In the case of young spiders born with great bloodlines, the results are different depending on what poisons they have ingested throughout their lives. Only when a spider consumes a lot of strong poison and in a variety of ways can it grow into an excellent adult spider. On the other hand, if only weak poisons or poisons of limited variety are consumed consistently, there seems to be a limit to how large one can grow no matter how much he or she consumes. Is it? Do they eat poison as food? Vikir took action immediately. When you bite your little finger and bleed, dark red drops of blood seep out. It was the blood containing Madame Eight Legs' powerful poison. But. Eek, yuck. The baby Madame, who had a drop of blood in her mouth, trembled and fell to the side again. You bastard. What's the problem this time? Vikir turned the pages of the book again. However, for chicks that have just hatched from an egg, they must be consumed gradually, starting with mild poisons. As spiders grow older, grow larger, and consume increasingly stronger and more diverse poisons, they develop a deadly venom that combines the strengths of numerous poisons, and soon reign as the pinnacle of the local ecosystem. Is it? Well, the mother's poison was strong. Madame Eight Legs' poison was definitely a poison that had never been seen before. Isn't the powerful acid mixed with all the worst characteristics of neurotoxin, hemorrhage poison, skin poison, muscle poison, gastrointestinal poison, odor poison, pain poison, respiratory poison, protoplasm poison, etc. It was definitely a difficult poison for a baby madam that had just hatched from an egg to digest. I get it. Let me get you a slightly weaker poison. Until then, bear with it like a bug. When Vikir catches a flying butterfly, the baby madam puts it in her mouth with a listless expression and mutters. Since it was given to me by the owner, I took it, but it still seemed blatantly distasteful. Right then. Vikir. Are you here? Piggy's voice was heard from far away. When Vikir raises his head, he immediately sees Piggy running towards him. Piggy was holding a newspaper in his hand. Vikir. We're in big trouble. How did you know I was here? How do you know? The only places you go all the time are the dormitory, classroom, club room, library, cafeteria, and fitness center. Ah, uh, anyway, that's not the point, did you see this? Piggy took a deep breath and thrust the newspaper article in front of Vikir. You're a star now. Episode 172, Anticolonist, 1. Vikir accepted the article Piggy held out. Exclusive, The Hound of the Night, The Birth of an Unprecedented Villain Who Roams the Ecliptic. The Hound of the Night has appeared again. Until recently, when the unprecedented fear of terrorism was gripping the entire ecliptic, the true nature of the threat was not clearly revealed. Nothing has been revealed about whether the Hound of the Night is an individual or a group, or what its purpose is, and no family, not even the Imperial family, has been able to reveal this. Accordingly, attention is being paid to who will be the first to uncover the identity of this vicious villain, and who will be able to apprehend him. The seven major families of the Empire, Iron-Blooded Swordsman Baskerville, Magic Master Morg, Window Singer Don Quixote, Shingun the Usher, Extremely Poisonous Hermit Leviathan, Rich Bourgeois Family, and Religious Singer Quo Vadis were arrested as terrorists. Demonstrating a strong will for the cause, a chase team was formed, and the imperial capital placed a bounty of zero billion gold on the head of the Hound of the Night. And underneath the newspaper, you can see some pictures that are moving due to magic. The newspaper was published by a large external newspaper company, and the photos showed the scenes where the night hounds attacked the tribes of the Quavadis family, especially the branches of the Old Testament faction. Of course, the orphanage run by the Indulgentia family at the bottom was also photographed, and Vikir was also seen there. Of course, Vikir only appears in a small corner of the photo, and next to him are Tudor and Sancho. Piggy, Bianca, Sinclair, etc. were also filmed together, so there wasn't really a problem. Look at this, Vikir. We were in the newspaper. There are days in my life where I am exposed to the media. Piggy was very surprised to be featured as a passerby in a corner of this small photo. 
but that only lasts for a moment, and Piggy soon becomes sullen. Oh. Come to think of it, this is a photo taken of the worst disaster scene. I can't believe you're happy that I came out to a place like this. I am the devil. Calm down. The person who caused the disaster is bad, not you. Vikir patted Piggy on the shoulder and went back to reading the newspaper. Um. There is no article about the saint declaring her crusade. Oh, strangely, that information wasn't published in the newspaper. Also missing is the story that Quo Vadis was attacked only by the Old Testament faction. The details of the Old Testament faction selling indulgences to social leaders and the details of the sins for which they were forgiven are also missing. Why wasn't it published? In response to Piggy's question, Bakir smiled dryly. That's what journalism is all about. A trumpeter for the strong. A dog barking for a more appetizing piece of meat. It is the law of the wild that you should only bite as much as you can handle. It seems that Cardinal Humbert's influence is that strong. Or did something, above, move. No matter where you look in the newspaper, there is no content criticizing the obscene practices of the Old Testament faction. However, in order to cover up this situation, they have made one hound of the night, a public enemy and are biting hard at it. And Piggy's words that followed made Vikir nod his head. Oh. Vikir. Did you hear this week's club assignment? My advisor asked me to write columns one by one condemning the terrorist acts of the Hounds of the Night. They say it just needs to be in the form of a simple current affairs commentary. As long as the writing is good, even a first-year student's work will be published in the Academy newspaper. It seems that the Academy has also decided to join in the hunt for the Hounds of the Night. For now, it would be better to follow this trend to avoid suspicion. Vikir could criticize the Hounds of the Night better than anyone else. This is because he is the one who knows his evil deeds better than anyone else. It's a column, is it okay if I just write down the absurd and absurd things I heard? Vikir took out a pen and held it. And then he began a difficult, battle with himself. Angry voices flow from the Academy's newspaper department. Why was the column I wrote killed? Dolores. Student Council President of Academy Colosio and Head of the Newspaper Department. She was now calmly protesting to Professor Morg Banshee, the advisor of the Newspaper Department. Are you asking because you don't know? Professor Banshee's eerie eyes shine through his black hair. A single eyeglass hung precariously at the end of his hooked nose. Professor Banshee threw Dolores' column onto the desk. What is the true opposite of, the Hound of the Night? The number of tribes of the Quo Vadis family attacked by the Hounds of the Night exceeded six. All of these tribes belonged to a group called the Old Testament Faction, which was the family of Quo Vadis. Meanwhile, according to data released by the New Testament Faction, behind this attack was a black market transaction between the Old Testament Faction and some prominent figures. Meanwhile, at the scene of all these disasters, no physical evidence of the murderer left behind by the Hound of the Night has yet been found. Professor Banshee spoke in a blunt tone. The Academy remains politically neutral. We can't let out biased current affairs reviews like this. You're biased. I just posted the facts. Is it true? Didn't Cardinal Humbert of the Old Testament faction deny all of these facts? And the social leaders listed on the list of indulgences also stated that it was not true. That is a lie. That might be the truth. Even if you miss one thief, you shouldn't end up wronging ten people. I guess this was your usual belief. Dolores pursed her lips. He gritted his teeth so hard that the veins on his neck stood out. Professor Banshee continued. Also, everyone knows that you, the Academy's student council president and head of the newspaper department, are the saints of Quo Vadis, the religious hymn at the core of this controversy. Also, the saints of the Quo Vadis family generally belong to the New Testament sect. Do you really think it would be okay for you to personally mediate and write such a biased article? Why not? Then a vein appeared on Dolores' forehead. She opened her mouth to Professor Banshee. The Academy's rules state that all students admitted to our school are equal and they are not influenced by status outside the Academy. Although I belong to the Quo Vadis family and am a member of the New Testament faction, my status is only outside the Academy. While I am a student at the Academy, I am just natural Dolores and a student at the Academy. 
you can also freely express your opinion about the Quo Vadis family. This time Professor Banshee kept his mouth shut. Dolores and Professor Banshee's gaze collide. Finally, Professor Banshee sighed. I understand. I admit it. As Dolores tilted her head, Professor Banshee frowned. The Quo Vadis family sent an official letter to the Academy. An official document? Okay. These are the reporting guidelines for this article. Press guidelines. It is to determine the direction of the sidewalk in advance. Professor Banshee shook his head. They said these articles should largely focus on the horrific terrorist acts committed by the Hounds of the Night and interviews with the victims. I was told to exclude keywords such as Quo Vadis, Old Testament, and New Testament as much as possible or remove them altogether. Nonsense. That is an attempt to control the neutrality of the Academy. Anyway, that's right. The Dean is also quite perplexed. Is Cardinal Humbert that powerful? To the point where even the Academy's Dean got into trouble. If it was just Cardinal Humbert, there's no way I would have listened to him in the first place, right? Dolores' expression hardened at those words. Above Cardinal Humbert. There is only one such being in Quo Vadis. Pope. Among the classical saints, she is the oldest and possesses noble divine power. How can he? Even if everyone else has become corrupted, he will not lose his integrity. But how is this happening? There are many people saying that the Pope has recently gotten older and his judgment has become a little blurred could it be that Cardinal Humbert is taking advantage of this opportunity to blind the Pope's eyes and ears? Dolores had a new worry. When she fell silent, Professor Banshee tapped the article on his desk with his finger. And what regardless of all these circumstances, your column is unsuitable for publication in a newspaper in the first place. It's too politically biased. When I read it, I can't help but get the impression that I am secretly on the side of the hound of the night. Then what do you plan to put in that empty space? Promotion of a new play released by a theater club. Naftali's famous scene from the sports club. The breathtaking backside of the Academy magazine cover model. Don't be sarcastic, Dolores. I am a professor. You are a student. Finally, Professor Banshee opened a drawer and took out a piece of paper. It was one column. Dolores' eyes narrowed. Wickedness that goes beyond the limits, the hound of the night. Dash, the hound of the night, crossed the line. The sin of insulting the imperial family and the seven great families has reached heaven if you listen to the cries of countless people who have been unfairly harmed soon the fearsome spears, swords, arrows, and magic will become the maces of justice and bring you to the judgment seat the author who personally saw the night hound in complete disrepair on the night when the tragedy occurred at the Indulgentia Orphanage, can confidently say if you turn yourself in right now, crane your neck and wait, this may be your last chance to welcome Malo in peace. Professor Banshee said. I'm thinking of publishing this column in a newspaper instead of yours. This is a crude piece of writing that only appeals to emotions without evidence, objectivity, or probability. The expressions are ambiguous and the emotions are excessive. Dolores spoke, using unusually strong vocabulary. These are probably the worst things she can say out loud. But Professor Banshee shook his head with a crooked smile on one side of his face. I don't think this article is very well written either. But they criticized appropriately, appealed appropriately, and agitated appropriately. That's why it's the best fit for this situation. Moreover, since it is an eyewitness account of what I saw in person, it has some credibility. Anyway, so you know. The midterm practical evaluation is coming soon, so work hard. After all, isn't a student's duty to study? Professor Banshee stood up, walked past Dolores, and walked out of the room. Dolores bit her lip. The last disaster in the Indulgentia family. This was to her chagrin, as she had spent that night with her night hound. Night Hound is not bad. Rather, what is worse is Quo Vadis, and the devil hiding within it. How many more devils like that are there in the world? How hard has the Night Hound been fighting so far, and how many more fights will he have to fight in the future? You can't help it, but you try to hinder and oppress it. However, there is no way to reveal at once the reality of the devil, his insiders, and those who are being used without their knowledge. 
even if there were, it would take too long. The night hound I met before said that time was running out. The frustrating conversation I had with Professor Banshee today gave me a clear understanding. Why was he able to survive, and why did he go around killing demons one by one, even at the risk of his own life? I can't do it. I have to help him too. No matter how much you write a column and side with the night hounds, it is of no real help. Now that the press guidelines have been passed down from home, it was time to grab a sword, not a pen, to help him. I should rather find the night hound on my own. I can see their faces and know their names, so I can help them. Saint Dolores made a decision. She decided to go see the night hound herself. To do this, we first had to gather as much information as possible. Things related to the identity of the night hound. Dolores' eyes turned to the paper on the desk. That was the column Professor Banshee chose over hers. An article full of criticism that harshly condemns the night hounds. Dolores frowned when she saw the article. It was a low-quality article that was unpleasant to look at, but one passage caught my eye. Wickedness that goes beyond the limits, the hound of the night. Dash, the hound of the night, crossed the line. The sin of insulting the imperial family and the seven great families has reached heaven if you listen to the cries of countless people who have been unfairly harmed soon the fearsome spears, swords, arrows, and magic will become the maces of justice and bring you to the judgment seat the author. Who personally saw the night hound in complete disrepair on the night when the tragedy occurred at the Indulgentia orphanage, can confidently say if you turn yourself in right now, crane your neck and wait, this may be your last chance to welcome Malo in peace. You mean you saw it firsthand? For context, when the writer of this column saw the night hound, it was clearly right after all the disaster had ended. That means I saw the night hound more recently than Dolores. Perhaps I may have witnessed the face behind the night hound's mask. Dolores became anxious. If this column is published in a newspaper, many reporters will probably flock to interview the contributor. Fortunately, Professor Banshee had made the column's author anonymous to prevent this, and Dolores was able to find out who the contributors to this column had not yet been published in the newspaper were. It's an abuse of power, but it can't be helped. This is absolutely necessary for justice. Dolores turned over the column and found the name of the person who wrote it. Eventually, she was able to find a familiar name there. Cold Weapon Donation Group B, Bakir. Episode 173, Anticolumist, 2. Exclusive Wickedness Beyond the Limit, Hounds of the Night Slash Number of Views, 3872. Dash, The Hound of the Night, Crossed the Line. The sin of insulting the imperial family and the seven great families has reached heaven if you turn yourself in right now, crane your neck and wait, this may be your last chance to welcome Malo in peace. Comment, 173. Fever donation year one the country is going well. Cold weapon donation first year student I think we need to arrest the night hound quickly. What is the imperial family doing? Cold disease donation, second year how busy can you be in this situation? By the way, is the imperial house your friend's house? Look at my speaking habits these days. Fever donation, fourth grade cry, classmates of the same age. I hate hunting dogs at night. This is it. Cold disease donation fourth grade this is correct asterisk. Fever donation year one ug, the comment window smells like an old man. Cold disease donation third year good article, let's spread it always only happiness. Fever donation year one but who wrote this column? Are you sure you saw the night hound in person? Vikir was a little surprised when he read the newspaper this morning. I never thought that column would actually be published. He chose only the words that seemed most similar to what he heard and used them, and it seems to have worked. The number of views was quite high and there were many comments, which was quite surprising. It seems like the fear of night hounds is spreading widely, isn't it? I heard that these days, when trying to comfort crying children in the imperial capital, there are many parents who say, if you keep crying, the night hounds will bite you. It appears that he has clearly established himself as a villain who brought fear to the empire. I guess I'll have to be more careful when I go out demon hunting in the future. It would be a bother if you ran into the Imperial Knights while wandering outside the academy. When Vikir was thinking about his future plans and worrying about various things. Vikir. A cold voice was heard. 
When I raise my head, Professor Mord Banshee's dark-circled gaze follows me a short distance away. Have you closed your eyes and been lost in thought today? It's not John's. Yes. That's right. You're still shameless. I need to see if I have the skills to do that. Professor Banshee, as always, did not like Fakir. So, they used to throw in small offenses, such as intentionally presenting wordplay problems that were twisted several times so that they could not be solved, or problems that were extremely difficult for undergraduate students to understand. The Imperial Army is having trouble with the large-scale insects that appear in large numbers on the Western Front every rainy season. Among these, tell me how to separate small individuals with a body length of less than 1m and large ones with a body length of 10m or more and tell them how to deal with them. The damage to travelers caused by goblins is getting worse day by day. Goblins are small and weak monsters, but because they move around in groups, they are a threat to those who do not know how to use mana. Discuss a realistic plan to prevent travelers leaving the gateway to the imperial capital from being attacked by goblins. We don't have much time, so go quickly. Answer only yes or no. The monster that currently causes the most damage to the knights and wizards guarding the highland fortress is the wyvern, but it is quite possible that it is the opposite of impossible to say that it is not. How are you feeling? The problem is that Vakir has never been wrong about those questions. In the case of small-scale insects less than 1 m in length, just sprinkling salt, sugar, or carbonic acid can cause fatal injuries, and in the case of large species, you can easily defeat them by shooting copper arrows. Goblins have a sensitive sense of smell and are weak to bad smells. If a ginkgo tree planted as a street tree drops fruit, rather than throwing it away, it would be a good idea to collect it and provide a sack each to travelers leaving the imperial capital. If you throw ginkgo nuts at a goblin, most of them will lose their will to fight and run away due to the bad smell. Yes. Vikir always answered calmly despite Professor Banshee's barrage of aggressive questions. There were two reasons for this. The first was that Professor Banshee's major classes were always related to actual monster strategy. This was Vikir's specialty for the past several decades, so he couldn't be wrong. Therefore, it is possible to present groundbreaking strategies that can complement or completely replace the outdated research of decades ago. The second was Professor Banshee's questioning style. Due to Vikir's personality of not wanting to attract attention, he would most likely give the problem as wrong as he wanted, but Professor Banshee always deducted the attitude score of the entire department to which the student belonged if he or she failed to answer his question or answered a question incorrectly. In other words, since Bakir was targeted by Professor Banshee, he had to continue to parry his attacks to increase the attitude points of the entire cold weapon department. Bakir decided that solving problems well and receiving additional points toward the overall attitude score would be a way to attract less attention from other students because people tend to remember grudges for a long time but quickly forget favors. We remember for a long time the penalty points we received unfairly because of others, but we quickly forget the points we were fortunate enough to receive thanks to others. Meanwhile, Professor Banshee couldn't get angry even though all his questioning attacks were cut. I cannot be quick to point out Vakir's answers because they were the kind of things only a veteran who had been on the battlefield for decades could give. How can an 18-year-old freshman know things that even he, a professor at the academy, had only learned about in theory on his desk in the lab? And that too, so crisply. Professor Banshee couldn't help but look even more displeased because some of the answers that Vakir had just given included strategies and theories that had never been discovered until now. Ku it was like that in the past during the Venompian incident. A giant scorpion-shaped monster that lives in the desert. Who would have known that there was a second sting hidden in it? Professor Banshee sent a sample of Venompian to the Royal Monster Research Institute to determine whether Vakir's claim was true or not. In the end, everything turned out to be true, and it immediately attracted the attention of the academic world. He waved his hand at the flood of interview requests. It was not I who studied it, but my students studied it. Joy. Since then, Professor Banshee has been watching Vakir with interest. In the end, Professor Banshee once again had no choice but to acknowledge Vakir's knowledge. You're very handsome. You're handsome. As for the theory, you can stand here instead of me and teach it to your classmates, even your seniors. Maybe even me. Not to that extent. 
Professor Banshee's expression distorts once more at Bakir's short answer. In the end, he growled. I hope you go to graduate school someday. And if you come under me. For the first time, Bakir felt scared at those words. The academy's graduate school is famous for being insanely rigorous. There's even a rumor that prisoners of war from other countries who lost the war and became slaves feel sorry for the academy's graduate students. However, the first-year freshmen who do not yet know this fact look back at Bakir and open their eyes wide. Not only was he recognized for his theory by Professor Banshee, but he was even recommended to go to graduate school. It was more difficult than putting a camel through the eye of a needle. In particular, Sinclair, the head of the fever division who was sitting in the front row, was now openly looking back at Bakir without even taking a glance. His gaze was bright with curiosity. After class is over. Bakir was also among the students who were packing their school bags and moving to their next class or dormitory. And there was one person who stood in front of Vakir and blocked him. This is Professor Mord Banshee of the Actual Monster Strategy course. Vakir. He called out to Vakir with the slightest hint of displeasure in his stern voice. When Vakir turned his head, he walked over and spoke with his mouth twisted and twisted. Your last column. Published in the newspaper. Professor Banshee is also an advisor to the newspaper department. He was also the one who published Bakir's commentary on The Hound of the Night in the newspaper. Professor Banshee asked, genuinely curious. Did you really witness the night hound in person during your volunteer work? It's just like I said last time. I just happened to meet him briefly while walking down the hallway at night. Is it? You really don't know faces or voices? Yes. I get it. That's it. Professor Banshee frowned and muttered quietly, it's because things like flies keep sticking to me. Finally, he looked at Bakir and continued. If there is an outside reporter who bothers to ask for an interview, please let me know. I have a duty to protect the students who work in the academy's newspaper department. Yes. Professor Banshee nodded at Bakir's short answer. Oh, wait. Just as he was about to turn around, Professor Banshee turned his head as if something suddenly occurred to him. But, if I had gone on volunteer work, that time would have been sleeping time and curfew time, so why was I walking down the hallway at night? It wouldn't have been in the direction of the bathroom or water purifier. Sorry. Sorry. Is that the end? Yes. Vikir still answered briefly. Professor Banshee frowned. Well, I know that there is a custom for male and female students to gather together and have a drinking party on the last day of volunteer work. Is that so? Yes. But I have no obligation to tolerate such things. Yes. Okay. Professor Banshee held up the ledger with a rough hand gesture and deducted Vakir's attitude score by one point. From now on, don't wander around at night. To the night hounds, don't wander around at night. Bakir nodded half-heartedly, and Professor Banshee then snorted happily and turned his head to go his own way. Then, my friends, who were just watching from afar, finally approached me. The first person to approach was Piggy. Vikir. Did you just get your attitude score deducted? Why? I broke the night curfew rule on the last day of volunteer work. OMG. You must be crazy. Did you tell the truth? Don't lie. If you accumulate penalty points again, you have to go back to volunteer work. This time it will just be volunteer work on campus. The Academy's principal's policy is not to send out volunteers to volunteer work these days, as the current situation is suspicious. Instead, I could have been put in the unfortunate position of having to volunteer on campus during the Golden Festival period after midterm exams. That was the reason Piggy felt sad now and Tudor and Sancho followed Piggy's footsteps. Hey, Bakir. What did Professor Banshee say? At least there would have been an argument. They were members of the same newspaper staff as Bakir, and they already knew that the writer of the column was Bakir. Tudor opened his mouth. Hey Bakir. Did you really see the Nighthound back then? Yes. Hey, kid. Why didn't you tell me? For some reason, it was serious all the way back that day. 
Judah approached with a serious expression and patted Vikir on the shoulder. How scared you must have been to meet that vicious villain. I wanted to do this because on the last day of volunteer work, you kept falling behind on your way back to the academy and you had to pee because you were thinking too much. If something like that happens in the future, please consult with us about your concerns. Sancho also stood next to Vikir and nodded. Meanwhile, the friends asked Vikir. The question was what the night hound looked like and how fearsome it was. Vikir just gave a cursory answer. He is very tall and has a good physique. He looked older too. Her face was covered with a mask and her entire body was covered with a black cloak. Her voice seemed hoarse. She was far away so I couldn't hear her clearly. At those words, Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy made a fuss, wiping away the goosebumps on their forearms. Wow, I guess I saw it for real. It must have been really scary. If it were me, I don't think I would have been frozen in place. You truly have great courage. I heard that the night hound must be at least a graduate level. Ugh, how strong is it? Should I be stronger than my professors? It's not that bad, right? The one-day puppies who used to fight each other to catch the night hounds are still fluffy. Vikir was watching the scene a little cutely. Right then. Who is this? Aren't they idiots who donate cold weapons? Another fluffy one-day puppy blocks Vikir's path. A handsome man with a cold expression on his face beneath his dark black hair. And a small snake-shaped badge on the chest. Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy's expressions hardened slightly when they saw his face. Granui. Granui de Leviathan. Among the seven families representing the empire, he is from the extremely poisonous Leviathan family. It was the appearance of the first-year vice president of the Fever Donation Club and an extremely arrogant first-year student. Episode 174, Anticolumist, 3. Who is this? Aren't they idiots who donate cold weapons? Granui de Leviathan. He is a thin, tall, and somewhat cold-hearted male student from the martial arts department. He is from Leviathan, an extremely poisonous hermit family, one of the seven major families of the empire, and was also the runner-up student at this year's fever donation club. He looked at Tudor and sneered. Why are you shaking so scared? It's so shaky that you can feel the vibration up to here. What are you saying, you crazy person? Tudor cut off Granui's sarcasm as if he was used to it. But Granui did not stop. He he he. From what I heard earlier, it seemed like they were having a discussion about Hounds of the Night. Do they have to be so timid to be able to say they belong to the prestigious Colossio Academy? They are so pathetic. Then you won't be scared. He even saw the night hound in person. Tudor said, pointing to Vikir. Then Granui smiled wryly. Is your name Vikir? You witnessed the night hound yourself. His name is Vikir. Are you showing off your memory by remembering the name of a lowly commoner? Granui glanced at Vikir with a mixture of interest and contempt. And he said with a shrug. Well, anyway. Do not tremble too much at the hounds of the night, weak and pitiful comrades. They say that incompetent people are timid, but isn't it still ugly to look at? If the night hound appears at the academy, I will personally come forward and protect even you insignificant bastards. This bastard's concept is really crazy. Hey, didn't we say that before we saw the disaster site with our own eyes? But if you look at newspaper articles, they say that night hounds are at least senior graduates. How dare you handle being a graduate? He he he, do you really believe that article? Innocent guys. Rumors tend to be exaggerated. I don't think a coward who walks around hiding behind a mask would reach such a high level. And. After finishing speaking, Granui waved his palm and pushed his colleagues behind him back. That moment. Push. A light black fog began to surround Granui's body. It was a paralyzing poison. Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy were frightened by the poison that mixed with mana and sprayed out like water mist. Granui, you crazy bastard. Is this a skills event on campus? This is just cuteness. It's just to briefly show my advanced skills. In reality, the amount of poison that Granui spewed out was not that great. 
a paralyzing poison that will leave you feeling numb and stiff for a few minutes if it touches your body. However, because of the image of Leviathan, an extremely poisonous hermit who is skilled in all kinds of poisons, everyone just gets scared and steps back. Only one person. Except Vakir. At first, Vakir also tried to take a step back. But? Hyup. There was a being that sucked up the black water mist that was sprayed at Vakir. The little madam hanging on her left wrist like a watch saw the poisonous mist sprayed by Granui and immediately began to take a deep breath. Hello. The poisonous fog completely disappeared before I could even blink, without even feeling like I was being sucked in somewhere. It's like a food fighter inhaling a chopstick of ramen. Kiak nuclear nucleus. The baby madam ate every last bit of the weak paralyzing poison and burped slightly. And then he sticks out his tongue again and makes a sharp noise as if he has never done that before. Vikir thought it was fortunate that he had this opportunity to get some food for his baby mama. Granui. This is because they come from the Leviathan family. Then he must have a lot of poison. Vikir began to watch closely the guy named Granui in front of him. Meanwhile, Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy were just blinking, not knowing what had happened. What? Where is the poison that Granui just sprayed? It suddenly disappeared. Wow, I was really surprised. Was it a fake? Even Granui himself was looking around, as if he was a little surprised. Uh. What, where has my poison gone? Why is G so surprised when G sprays it? Aren't you stupid? As Tudor sarcastically remarks, Granui utters a sigh, but soon comes to his senses. Granui refuted, slightly flustered. Just now, this body showed me a generosity deeper than the abyss. It would have been a waste of poison to use on you cold-blooded fools whose brains were also made up of muscles. Soon, Granui's cold, dark gaze turned towards Vakir and Piggy. Looking at them, they are commoners who don't even look like experts. Looking at these guys, I knew roughly the level of cold weapon donation. It's so boring it makes me want to die. The average practical skills of freshmen currently working at the academy range from low to intermediate expert, and the average of the graduating class is upper expert. Despite being only 18 years old, two years younger than their classmates, Tudor, who was already at the advanced level of expert, and Sancho, who was at the intermediate level of expert, were exceptional geniuses. In Piggy's case, he was a low expert level, and while he was quite talented on the outside, he was below average inside the academy. At that time, Tudor, the leader of the group, stepped forward. Do not insult my friends, Granui. Hee <laughs> hee, they say you can tell a person's level by looking at the friends they hang out with. Looking at your friends, I can see your level. Granui did not lose pace despite Tudor's threats. In the background, Granui's colleagues, the elites of the fever division, could be heard giggling. You guys, don't insult the academy I belong to with your lowly and inferior skills. Well, everything will be proven during the practical evaluation of this midterm exam. The midterm practical evaluation is just the first test. I'm not trying to prove anything through this. It's like a guideline for further development in the future. Shut up, to me midterms are murder. Take it seriously. That way, it will be rewarding to break you down as you struggle with your poor and shallow talent. At that time. Brother, what are you doing there? There was someone approaching, calling for Vakir. Sinclair. Although she was a commoner, she was the head of the fever donation department and was coming this way. As soon as Sinclair approached Vakir, he smiled and asked. Have you read all the books you borrowed from the library last time? You mean Raising Spiders? Ha! Huh. I also read some related books. Do you want to discuss it together later? Done. Why? Didn't you study it so that you could use it later in a real-world monster strategy class? No. Otherwise, why are you studying in advance? Please let me know too so I can do well on the written test. Sinclair's eyes as he looked at Vakir showed serious enthusiasm and curiosity. Granui's expression became distorted when he saw that. TCH, the only option for these insignificant commoner bastards is solidarity. These pathetic people, whose only way to survive is to tangle with each other in crude grassroots. Without speaking, he called Sinclair. 
Hey. Sing, sing, sing Claire. You're disgraceful about donating fever and doing it all by yourself. Don't do that, come here. If it's handwritten, I'd rather tell you. It is absolutely not to do you a favor, it may be a temporary phenomenon, but as a part of protecting your image as the head of the fever donation department, you are afraid that if you hang out with the cold disease donation guys, the rank of the fever donation department will look lower. But Sinclair just blinks his big eyes and tilts his head. Who are you? What? Do you not know me? Sinclair, you do not know. I am Granui de Leviathan, the current vice president of the Ministry of Armed Forces. The three princes of the Leviathan family, the vice president of the Academy's military donation department, and the future student council president. How can you not know that I come from a noble family and have excellent grades? I'm just trying to remember the name of that commoner, Bakir, or Bikur. If you are trying to keep me in check by pretending not to remember my name out of fear of losing your position as chief, then I want to tell you not to resist the fate that will come anyway. Then Sinclair spoke hesitantly, looking very embarrassed. I don't know. Sorry. I'll remember it from now on. Mr. Kurakuru. Then Granui looked shocked once again. Cannot believe it. How can you not know me? Calm down, Granui. That girl, she's deliberately engaging in psychological warfare. That's right. How could I not know you? This is why lowly commoners. While his colleagues are patting him, Granui's shoulders look particularly sagged. Meanwhile, Vikir and his group left the hallway and came out near the central stairs. See you later, brother. Sinclair waves to Vikir and heads to the library. When there were only four men left again, Tudor finally became irritated. Oh, Granui, that arrogant bastard. Maybe I should scold them during the midterm exam. That is correct. It's a pity that there is no sparring course for each cadet in the first year exam. Sancho, who usually does not participate in slandering others, also rarely joined in. At that time, Piggy poked Vikir's side. Vikir, what happened? What? Sinclair. What? Sinclair. So what? As Vikir expresses doubt, question marks also appear above the heads of Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy, who were watching. Do you know what happened between you two? Otherwise, why would he be so kind to you when he has no interest in other people's affairs? That's right. It seemed like honey was dripping from the way you were looking at me earlier. However, Bakir responded firmly to the suspicions raised by his friends. There is no such thing. Then my friends looked a bit glum. When Vikir denied the rumors of a romantic relationship or a relationship, the topic turned again to the story of the Nighthound. Since it is a hot potato that is shaking up the capital these days, friends also seem to be very interested. But the night hounds are really scary. If you have graduate level skills, you could easily join the knights, so why did you become a villain? I think there's some story behind it. Or maybe he's just a real murderous maniac. Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy talk a lot. At that time, Tudor tapped Vakir's arm and said playfully. Hey, Vakir. Aren't you the night hound? Vikir just moves his eyebrows. Why do you think that? In response to Vikir's serious question, Tudor smiled and said without thinking. No, you were the only one who fell behind on the way back to the dormitory. So you're the only one without an alibi. What? I did say that when the security asked us for statements, we all went back to our rooms and fell asleep actually, you were in the laundry room at that time, right? For washing my pants. Ha 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 dash. Uh. I'm sorry. It was a joke, but there was no need to be so serious, I didn't know you still cared about that, sorry. Tudor laughed and immediately apologized as if he had missed it. Vikir grinned. Then Tudor finally smiles again. Ah, man. Why are you looking so scary? You're even scarier because you're so expressionless. Tudor. You were bad, that memory must still be a scar to Vikir. That's right. Sancho and Piggy also reprimanded Tudor, and Tudor even bowed his head and apologized to Vikir. 
It is difficult for a man who is the eldest son of the high-ranking Don Quixote family to be this flawless. Vikir smiled dryly, recalling the fairness, justice, and childlike innocence that the great hero Tudor had before his return. But I had to make sure I had an excuse. I am not the Night Hound. He is a graduate-level monster, and I am an inferior student who struggles even at expert level. Why are you saying something so obvious? I'm kidding too. Then Sancho and Tudor also nodded. Right. There is no way Vikir is such a vicious villain. Okay. Vikir, let's quickly improve our skills and catch those villains ourselves. Finally, Vikir also nodded. Okay. A wicked villain like the Hound of the Night will be punished someday. These were serious words addressed to oneself. Right then. Koham Koham. As soon as Vikir finished speaking, a loud coughing sound was heard from the stairs directly above. Everyone looked up with a puzzled expression. There, I see a familiar face looking towards me. The student council president of Colosio Academy, the president of the newspaper club Ryukian, and the saint of the religious hymn Quo Vadis. It was Dolores. Episode 175, Anticolumnist, 4. Dolores. She read the article in the newspaper and thought of Vikir once again. Wickedness that goes beyond the limits, the hound of the night. Dash, the hound of the night, crossed the line. The sin of insulting the imperial family and the seven great families has reached heaven surrendering right now, craning your neck and waiting is the last chance to welcome Malo in peace. To be honest, it didn't feel good to see the harsh criticism being thrown at the night hounds. And that bad feeling got even worse because I saw Vikir, who had taken the time to meet me, cursing the night hound again. Nice villains like the, the night hound will be punished one day. The moment Dolores heard the words of Vikir and other juniors, she felt pain as if her heart had been stabbed. It was even more sad and miserable than when he heard himself cursed. You know what you're blaming him for. Ordinary people criticize heroes, but I know I can't blame them for that. Like the great prophet Rune, who wore a crown of thorns and carried a stake by the citizens in the distant past, the Hound of the Night also makes this noble sacrifice even at the risk of becoming the target of everyone's misunderstanding and hostility. It was said that true heroes do not force blood on the public. Dolores pursed her lips. I could scold my juniors here and shout out the innocence of the Night Hound, but that may not be what he wants. Are you okay? Not everyone knows the Night Hound's sacrifice. Just me. I just need to know and remember his sacrifice. A genius and a prophet that the world does not understand. Dolores even felt a sense of mission, knowing that only she could understand him. Ordinary citizen. As the ignorant masses hate, hate, fear and loathe the hounds of the night. Dolores' feelings for the night hound evolve into affection, respect, longing, and a heartbreak that even she herself can't quite define. Dolores' unprecedented feelings were growing bigger and bigger as each day passed, and she was now unable to sleep well at night. These days, every day is unfamiliar with emotions I've felt for the first time in my life. Dolores took her hand off the railing and turned around. I came here to meet Bakir, but if I see his face now, I can't talk to him because I think he will be angry. Isn't she in a position to even be angry? It was not a good time for conversation, so she had no choice but to turn her back on Vakir. After returning to her dorm room, Dolores took a shower and sat down at her desk. But Vakir, you have to talk to her. Vakir is the only one among the academy students to have witnessed the night hound in person. So there was a real need to hear what he saw that day. And one more thing. You should definitely apologize for the urinating incident as well. Vicar is like a benefactor to Dolores. This is because Dolores, who made a mistake after drinking, was given the stigma of being a urinator instead. It must have been really difficult to say that you were the one who urinated in a situation where everyone's eyes were focused on you. It is unknown what Vakir was thinking when he sacrificed himself in such a situation, but since he did not demand anything in return or show any condescension, it is assumed that his intention was pure. Ha, as long as you don't insult Night Hound, you're a really good junior. Dolores was feeling ambivalent towards Vakir. At first, he was an arrogant junior that I wasn't interested in at all, or even hated. 
I thought he was a bit unusual when I saw him sing a military song during the freshman talent show and make old professors cry, but after that, her image gradually deteriorated due to frequent tardiness and penalty points. We also gave several warnings to students who seemed to take the rules lightly, such as falling asleep during class or wandering into prohibited areas. The Cure Life Attitude Score, Point Deduction Factors Use of the emergency exit on the third grade floor of the dormitory building, one point. Entry to the fourth grade exclusive area of the training center, one point. Use the central staircase on the first floor of the deadly poison experiment building, one point. Entering the control area of the experimental monster breeding facility, one point. Use the central staircase on the sixth floor of the professor's lab, one point. Use the central staircase on the third floor of the dedicated training room for fever donation, one point. Entry to the fitness room outside of available hours, one point. Entry into no-go area for non-officials next to the food warehouse at the cafeteria, one point. The Kier's penalty point record was shocking to look at again. How can such figures be recorded as soon as one enters school? This is something that Dolores, who has always lived a regular and upright life, could not even imagine. Especially in the case of the monster breeding farm control area, the penalty point was three points. Did you say that your arms are bent inward? Since we were juniors in the same club, it was also Dolores' consideration to turn a blind eye to some extent and adjust the penalty point to one point. However, as the penalty points continued even after that, Bakir's image was completely branded as a bad student. But. He did his volunteer work too hard to just dismiss him as a bad student. While volunteering at an orphanage, Bakir worked quietly and faithfully in places that others did not see, such as the bathroom, cafeteria, plumbing room, laundry room, playroom, and playground. Work that is hard and arduous but not noticeable. He was a strange guy who grew up fine and wasn't used to hard work, so when other academy students couldn't even work for one person, he took on more than five to six people's worth of work on his own, and yet he didn't show any condescension and didn't ask for any recognition. At the last moment, Bakir even gave up his entire body to save the children's toys that had fallen into the cesspool. The sight of him returning the balls to the children while dripping filth from his body is like a murderer himself. Who would be so willing to jump into a cesspool for the sake of others? And Vikir's act of giving up himself for others was not the only one that happened that day. People can make mistakes after drinking. These were the words spoken by Vikir, who was framed on behalf of Dolores, who had urinated. What Vikir said at that time was definitely about Dolores. When she remembers that moment, Dolores' face turns red again. After that, no matter how much I explained, it was of no use. Dolores revealed that she was the one who peed several times, but everyone laughed it off, saying it couldn't have happened. Rather, they only praised him because they thought he was trying to sacrifice himself on behalf of Vakir. After that, Vakir's image at school got worse and Dolores' image got better, and Dolores felt very sorry about that. Ha! Dolores sighed deeply. I need to apologize and express my gratitude for taking care of the children at the daycare center and for bearing the nickname P. Wetter. But regardless, I couldn't help but feel angry every time Bakir insulted the Hound of the Night. Because the Night Hound is the noblest and noblest person she has ever known in her life. Phew but that doesn't mean you can't defend the Night Hound in front of someone who doesn't know anything. Maybe this is a good thing. Dolores placed her hand on her forehead. After thinking for a while, she quickly came to a conclusion. Regardless of the night hound, we must express our apology and gratitude to Vakir. I also had to ask for information about the night hounds. Okay. Let's distinguish between public and private matters. Just apologize for what you need to apologize for and be thankful for what you need to be thankful for. Dolores left the dormitory to find Vakir. I can't go with my bare hands to say sorry and thank you. Besides, I have to ask for information about the night hound. Vikir, what does he need? Dolores was in an unfortunate situation in many ways. This situation was very awkward for her because she had never owed anyone anything in her life. At that time. Suddenly, a familiar face appears in front of her. Chubby body and cute face. There was a junior named Fiji who always accompanied Vikir. Hey, Piggy. Do you know where Vikir is right now? Ancient. 
Oh. Hello Chairman. If you're Vakir, you're probably practicing your practical skills at the training center right now. But for some reason? Well, just. I thought I would take care of the juniors in the club before the exam. You take this too. It was a summary of key points that Dolores had written in first grade as a genealogy related to the written exam. Piggy accepted it and looked thrilled. I'll watch it with Vakir. Thank you. Uh, no. You can also give it to Vakir separately. There are a lot of copies. Oh, is that so? Then, if you go through this forest road and over the hill, you will find the training ground where Vakir practices. That is where the archery class was held, and students would be practicing freely during this time. Vakir used a bow. Dolores nodded and headed to the training hall. I was thinking hard about what to say first to Vakir, whom I would soon meet. Episode 176, 99 with white hair, 1. A spacious training ground. The sound of arrows hitting the target in the distance is loud. Puck. 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 Among the students attending Colosio Academy who use bows, they often gather here to practice. Students from the Cold Weapon Department's archery class mainly use this place, and on rare occasions, students from the Heat Weapon Department's long-distance magic class who had an unusually long range also tended to visit here. For other general students, it was a place they didn't need to come to because they only used bows in general education classes. And Among the few students visiting this place, the one who boasted the most outstanding archery skills was Bianca. She was also the head of the cold weapon department and was very good at shooting arrows as she came from the Usher family, also known as the Shingumbi family. Puck. The arrow Bianca shot accurately hit the target 100 meters away without using a single ounce of mana. A yellow circle within a black circle within a white circle, a red circle within a blue circle. All of Bianca's arrows were tightly packed inside that yellow circle. Wow, did you just see that? Another 10 points. It's really awesome. It's a different class. With that level, I would definitely get a high score on the midterm practical exam. She's like the goddess of the hunt. The other students around her were all just uttering exclamations of admiration at the almost divine archery she was showing. But. There are two nines mixed up. The wind is not good today and the conditions are not good. Bianca herself seemed unsatisfied even though she had put all the arrows into the smallest circle. As a perfectionist, she was dissatisfied with not being able to place all the arrows in the exact center, that is, the smallest yellow circle. If things had been as usual, I might have been somewhat satisfied with the fact that out of the ten arrows I had just fired, I had shot eight at tens and two at nines, earning a score of 98 out of 100. But. I don't like it. Today, her obsession with scores, which bordered on myceliac disease, became even more severe. Puck. It was because of the dull noise coming from the road right next to it. Puff puff. A sound that explodes one after another without a single moment. The moment one arrow flies and hits the target and makes a sound, before the sound is even heard, the next arrow flies right next to it and hits it. This happened ten times in a row. Ten out of ten arrows, ten arrows worth one hundred points. Oh, ten steps. Bianca frowned instead of bowing in protest. Then he glanced around and looked at the person standing next to him. Bushy bangs covering nearly half of the face, white skin, and simple clothing. Slightly shorter and thinner than ordinary eighteen-year-old boys. Vikir. Cold weapon donation class be like Usher Bianca. He was always expressionless, but today he was standing in the aisle holding a practice bow and arrows. Kiririk. Vikir feeds arrows to the bow. The target is a target 100 meters away. A yellow circle with a diameter of 12.2 centimeters. It falls 1.3 m above the ground and looks like the eye of a needle. Ting. Vikir held a protest. Pow. Without fail, ten points are obtained, the highest score that can be achieved with one arrow. Students who were practicing arrows nearby stopped what they were doing and came around to watch Vakir's archery skills. Wow, he shoots really well. Do you see that over there? I just see a yellow dot. Isn't he Vakir? 
That handwriting is number one. Oh, is that the handsome boy? You can't see it because of your bangs. That guy was a bowman. For some reason, my mana reserves were low. It doesn't matter if archers have a little less mana. Meanwhile, Bianca, who was shooting an arrow at the arrow next to him, found herself in a strange situation. Shingunbi's usher Bianca is an honor student with a reputation for archery skills within the academy. In other words, when she stands on the stage, the audience's gaze should be directed in this direction. But she usually hated others watching her shoot an archery. He said he felt like a clown. But what about now? People's attention is not on themselves but on Vikir next to them. It's not that he was disappointed that he didn't receive attention, but he was displeased that the public seemed to be implicitly evaluating Bakir's skills as better than his own. Bianca turned her head and took a peek at Bakir's archery stance. The conclusion is a mess. Bakir could not be said to have good posture even with empty words. Knocking, grip, hooking, set up, drawing, anchor, full draw, release, fallow through, there was nothing that fit the norm. But. Ting. As always, after Vikir leaves the protest. Pow! The arrow flies and hits the perfect score. How on earth do you shoot? I can't tell even though I'm looking at it. Vikir's posture seemed so relaxed that it seemed as if there was no structure or formality whatsoever. It looked like a bow fired randomly by a savage living in the forest. If you shoot like that, it usually ends up being a blind arrow, so how on earth does it hit the target? Bianca glared at Vakir with her brows furrowed. She too fiercely protested. Puck. As expected, the arrow hits ten points. Bianca was also steadily putting one foot into the center of the target. However, there is one difference from Vakir. Puck. 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 Puff 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 puff. The point is that the shooting speed is at a different level. While Bianca was concentrating and firing one shot, Bakir was firing five or six shots in succession. Although the scores earned by the two people are similar, there is a huge difference in the speed at which arrows are used up. Profit. Do you think it's sweet as long as it's fast? Bianca bit her lip. But contrary to her claims, Bakir was not only fast. Bakir's arrows, which have a fast rate of fire and are accurate, continue to produce ten point shots. On the other hand, Bianca, who shot two nine-point shots due to poor concentration in the early part, was definitely two points behind Vakir. You can't make a single mistake from now on. A slight difference in the beginning leads to a huge gap in the second half. This is a common occurrence that occurs along the trajectory of an arrow. Because of this, Bianca was even more focused than in the actual battle. More so than ever before. Eventually, her last arrow after leaving the demonstration hit the target. Puck. But there was a sad result. Perhaps because her thumb slipped due to sweat, Bianca's arrow was stuck in the nine-point box. Damn it. Bianca felt like throwing away her bow and running around. However, there are many eyes watching, so we should not be disturbed here. Be as calm as possible. You can't lower the honor of the royal family. If the eldest daughter of the Usher family, famous for its advanced archery skills, were to be outclassed by the base archery skills of a commoner with no genealogy, it would certainly be a laughing stock throughout the world. Click. Bianca protested, conscious of the fact that Bakir in the next room had stopped shooting archery at some point. All eyes are focused on the tip of the dot, a single glimpse. Yet. Payung. The arrow flies through several layers of overlapping walls of atmosphere. That. Pow. I hit the square X10 right in the middle of the target. Pacock. That too, splitting the arrow that was stuck in front in half. It's okay. Bianca cried out in delight. 141 10 point shots, 3 9 point shots. In addition, he achieved the feat of hitting the fingernail sized. As a result, Bianca fired a total of 144 arrows, and her score was 1,437 out of 1,440. Considering that Bianca's score usually fluctuates between 1433 and 1435 points, today's record was particularly good. 
Because Bakir, the pacemaker and competitor, was next to him, he was able to maintain a high level of concentration until the second half, and that was probably the reason why this result was possible. Meanwhile, the people watching were exclaiming in exclamation. It's really amazing. After all, it is a shrine. It hits the center of the foot. Hey! But, isn't Bakir great too? People's attention is once again drawn to the road next to Bakir. After shooting all the arrows, Bianca also turned her head and looked at Bakir. What are you doing? Bianca tilted her head slightly. After firing all 143 shots, Bakir was aiming for the last shot for a long time. Geek. The tension that sustains a protest cannot be ignored, no matter how large and muscular the merchant is. This is especially true if you haven't used any mana. But despite this, Bakir just stands motionless with his protests tense. This is completely different from shooting arrows at a tremendous speed until now. Why, why don't you shoot? I don't know, man. I guess he's trying to concentrate. What are we going to put so much effort into in the end? Isn't 10 points the end anyway? There is no higher score than that. Okay, just stick to 10 points like you've been doing so far. Wow, so if I get 10 points right this time, I get 1440 points out of 1440? Awesome, this is my first time seeing you. Isn't the Academy's official highest score up to now 1439 points? If you don't use mana at 100m distance. That's right. I think it was about 30 years ago. The record that the current head of the Usher family set while he was a student at the Academy is officially the highest point. Oh my god, it's a shame this is an unofficial record. Maybe this is a historic record-breaking moment. The students watching also swallowed dry saliva without realizing it. The same thing happened to Bianca next door. A tense tension flowing through the intestines. Yet. Pop. Vikir's bow spit out an arrow at the end of its length. And the moment the arrow flies to the target and lands with a thud. Everyone, including Bianca, had to open their eyes wide. Episode 177, 99 with white hair, 2. In a tense atmosphere. With everyone's attention focused. Pop. Vikir's bow spit out arrows. It flies in a parabola that is close to a straight line and soon knocks on the target. Sigh. But. The sound of it being plugged in is a little strange. Bianca couldn't believe her eyes. Six points. I was so surprised that words came out of my mouth. Bianca's face turns red at the fact that others have discovered that she was conscious of Vikir all along. However, since all the people gathered had similar reactions, fortunately, they were not caught. Eh. What, have you gone astray now? What six points is also a good score. Oh, what a waste. I guess I made a mistake. Ah, uh, maybe it was the birth of a new record. I messed up at the end. Everyone whispers together. Bakir quietly put down his bow as if he wasn't particularly interested. There is a separate employee who collects arrows later at night, so there is no need to collect them. Yet. Beep beep. Bakir's records are displayed in real time on the mana display board in front of him. 143 10 point shots, and one 6 point shot was the last shot. As a result, Bakir shot a total of 144 arrows, and his score was 1436 out of 1440. It was only one point lower than Bianca's score of 1437, who shot 141 10 point shots and three 9 point shots. Bianca, who won by one point, was more dumbfounded than happy. What are the six points at the end? Why did the guy who had only gotten ten points right all this time end up at the end? Have you suddenly lost concentration? To be honest, even when I shot the X-10 at the end, I didn't think I could win. That's because Vikir's momentum was at a loss. However, after defeating the enemy so vainly, only doubts arise. People disperse just as easily as they gathered together. Hey, it's Leaky. Let's go practice. Still, for someone from a commoner background, it's amazing. But a new record is that difficult to break. Aren't you lucky in the first place? The target was a little close. 
those who don't know much about bows pick them up at random and go their separate ways. But. Bianca waited patiently until Vakir left and all the crowd of onlookers had disappeared. Eventually, when all eyes around her disappeared, she crossed to the end of the deserted road. Numerous arrows can be seen messily placed in the targets. These are to be collected by staff after curfew each night. Bianca stuck out her tongue when she saw Vakir's target. I was wondering how that guy got into the academy with such little mana reserves. Even slugs have a knack for rolling. Vikir was not really a scholar who was only good at writing. However, Bianca did not harbor the jealousy or envy typical of nobles over the fact that people from commoners achieved as much success as those from nobles. It just burns the spirit and desire to win. Hey, when I saw you take off your clothes after Naphtali, your small muscles were no joke. It's a sign of harsh training. When it comes to bows, this is a method that allows you to fully demonstrate your skills with a small amount of mana. Even if your mana is low, if you distribute it well and provide long-range damage, you can be of great help to your colleagues. Well, I'm not interested in men he's definitely a bit unusual. Bianca rested her chin and analyzed the arrows that hit the target. At the very center of Vakir's target stood a thick cylinder. It looks like a pillar because so many arrows were stuck together in one place. All arrows are stuck within ten points. Some of them are broken into several pieces and tattered by arrows coming from behind. But those were not Bianca's concerns. Just one misfired bullet. Bianca focused on an arrow stuck in the blue line near the edge of Vakir's target. The last six point shot. Because of this, Vakir lost a whopping four points and lost by one point to himself. Of course, Vakir himself didn't seem to care at all, but Bianca was curious about it. Why did they shoot six at the end? It is doubtful that it is the result of a lack of concentration or stamina. This is because the previous scores were very good. The bow is originally a weapon whose success or failure depends on a moment's concentration still, isn't this a bit harsh at the end? But there is no explanation other than that. It can only be seen that Vakir failed because his concentration and stamina were not enough to last until the end. Sheesh, it ended on a dull note. He was a pretty good opponent. Bianca clicked her tongue and turned around. If it weren't for something that caught Bianca's eye right before she turned around. Huh. Bianca, who has good eyesight, noticed something and stopped just before she took her eyes off Vakir's target. It was Vakir's last shot, a six-point arrow, stuck in the blue line. Bianca's gaze touches the tip of the arrow and she trembles. A small solid line sticking out of the hole made by the arrow. It was clearly the leg of a tiny insect, such as a mosquito. Oh no way. I guess not. Bianca's throat becomes dry. Her eyes were alternately focused on the group of arrows that were stuck in the ten-point box of the target, forming a thick pillar, and on the single arrow that had fallen out of the group and was stuck in the six-point box. Just one misfired bullet stuck alone. Is it really a coincidence that there was a dead mosquito there? Vikir left the training ground as soon as he shot all his arrows. Physical training without using mana is real. I continued to use my arm muscles, but my entire upper body felt sore. The archery skills learned from Balak's warriors were improving day by day. This is because I continued to practice without stopping even after coming out of flood. You can't go anywhere and get pushed around with a bow. This is true even if the opponent is a powerful late exponent of Shingumbi. That would be protecting the pride of the warrior tribe Balak even in a country far away. Because Vikir came from Balak's hunting grounds. So, I hope everyone is doing well. I heard a rumor that the Balak tribe abandoned their original base and went deeper into the sea. Recently, I heard about the Balak tribe's current situation through Thindi Wendy, but it seemed like several months had already passed. After shooting an arrow for the first time in a while, I felt refreshed. Chief Akila, the fox of the night, a hun who was always bickering, Ahail, the cute younger sister, Bakira who is now a father, etc. Today is an evening where I really miss my native friends, whom I have cried and laughed with for the past two years. And there's one more. That rainy night naturally comes to Vakir's mind. See you again. It was still an imperial language that was difficult to understand. Ayan. 
the day she left the jungle, the girl who kissed her right after punching her in the stomach. Vikir stroked the choker around his neck. This tough leash had been put on by her herself and was made from the skin of the ox bear that Vikir and Ayan first hunted together. At that time, Vikir, who was smiling faintly as he remembered the faces he missed, stopped in his tracks for a moment. Jiapuk, Jiapuk, Jiapuk. I hear footsteps in front of me. Vikir, who had a particularly sensitive sense of energy, knew like a ghost that it was Dolores' presence. It's becoming a nuisance. Dolores doesn't like herself very much. When we met, there was a risk that he would nag me about one thing or another. Because it was a trail with not many places to hide and only tall ash trees standing in a straight line, there was no place to take shelter. After thinking for a moment about what to do, Bakir searched his arms. Mask of human faces, picaresque slash mask. Brotherhood plus zero. Human face water heart off. A hood that looks like the scalp of a black dog has been removed. Vikir put it on his head. Moment. Tsutsutsutsu. Vikir's body turned into a dog. It was a black puppy that was not yet big enough for its age. Nucleus Nucleus. Vikir roughly pushed the stripped clothes into the bushes and sat quietly on the ground waiting for Dolores to pass by the mountain path. Soon, Dolores appeared from across the street. Dolores was walking quickly and quickly for some reason. She was walking diligently towards the archery range. Do you have anything to do at the training ground? There are few people there. From what Vikir remembered, there weren't many people left in the gym, and among them, there weren't any that Dolores could find. If so, how about Bianca? Okay. Looks like he's going to see Bianca. Go quickly. Vikir was lying calmly on the floor, his tongue constantly coming out of his mouth without realizing it. It's a similar reaction to the baby madam who left it in the room. Right at that moment. Oh. Dolores stopped in her tracks. She opens her already innocent-looking eyes even more gently and looks down. This was the floor where Vikir was lying face down. Hey. Who are you? Vikir was a little taken aback by Dolores' friendly call. Is that why? Even Vikir, who was always quick, was not prepared for Dolores' surprise touch. Wow, look at how soft the fur is. Ogwogu. Dolores strokes Vikir's head with her hand and then scratches his cheek and chin. And with his other hand, he massaged Vikir's back and buttocks. Wow really are you shockingly cute. I've never seen a cute girl like you. What is your name? Where are you from? If you don't have anyone to live with, would you like to live with me? Before Vikir could react, Dolores reached out with both hands and placed them under both of Vikir's armpits and lifted them up. Young Cha Ah. It was your older sister, not your older sister. Moment. Vikir felt an unprecedented sense of shame that he had never felt even when he was living in an era of destruction. Dolores was quite a dog lover, befitting her gentle and kind appearance. I heard that they use their small income to donate to a center that protects abandoned dogs and cats every year, and also do volunteer work every other month. Right then. Truly terrifying words and actions came out of Dolores' mouth. Really. If you want to live with your sister, you have to be neutered. Bakir decided that there was no reason to continue listening to these creepy words and actions, so he quickly ran away. Hodadak. A black fur ball that quickly escapes from Dolores' arms. The slightly protruding pink tongue is sharp. Oh. Hey, don't do that, let's go with your sister. My sister will buy me pork cutlet. It's chocolate. Dolores looked regretful and even called out the name she had already given, but Vakir did not look back even for a moment. Episode 178, 99 with white hair, 3. The Academy's Indoor Training Center. There are numerous state-of-the-art training equipment here. In addition to various exercise equipment, there are rooms that create virtual dungeons or monsters as holograms, rooms that measure the body's magic power, rooms that quantify damage inflicted, etc. However, the best technology by far is the room called the gravity room. In this room, you can arbitrarily control the applied gravity, and a record of how long you lasted in that multiple is displayed. Of course, if you overdo it, 
the gravity in the gravity room will randomly disappear and the records will be reset. And right now. Push. The door to the first year gravity room opened, and a man covered in sweat walked out. A well-trained, muscular black-haired boy. He was, Granui de Leviathan, the third prince of the Leviathan family. Phew. After all, seven times the gravity without using mana is difficult. This is like the weight of fate that a noble person carries from his birth. Granui shrugged, enjoying the odd looks he felt from those around him. Considering that most students find it difficult to withstand even six times the force of gravity, enduring seven times the force of gravity for over thirty minutes was clearly an incredible record. Granui felt like he was going to throw up a little, but he held it in and wiped his sweat nonchalantly. But? The gazes of respect and envy directed at you are somehow a bit distorted. I'm not. Granui shifted his gaze towards the direction where the other students in the fitness room were all looking. At that place. There was a sight that made Granui's eyes widen. It was the dashboard of another gravity room right next to it. F2 gravity room. Gravity coefficient, 8 times. Current usage time, 59 minutes 12 seconds. Whether to use mana, n. A whopping 8 times the gravity. The entry time there is close to an hour. Records that are still being updated even at this very moment. Nonsense. Granui opened his mouth. He became dizzy and vomited just by being in seven times the gravity for thirty minutes. But who on earth can survive for an hour in gravity that is eight times stronger? If the user's physical condition becomes serious, gravity automatically disappears and the record is reset. That means are you saying that the guy in here is really withstanding this gravity? There are only a few people, not just first-year students, but even among upper-year students, who can withstand an eightfold gravitational field without using mana. And that takes about an hour. At that time. Pushyuk. The gravity room has stopped operating. Only when exactly one hour had passed did the door open and thick steam came out from inside. Who are you? The one who can withstand eight times. Granui looked inside, breaking into a cold sweat. There are few monsters in the academy that can withstand this much gravity. Not in the column department, probably Tudor or Sancho in the cold department department. Granui finished his thought with a shit-chewing expression. But. What came out of the gravity room was a completely different face. Vikir. A commoner male student who always walks around with an expressionless face. Granui's expression distorted when he saw him. No, how can that weak guy withstand eight times that? Isn't there something wrong with this record? OMG. But Granui could not finish his sentence. As the steam completely clears, the area below Vikir's face begins to become visible. The body shape that had always seemed thin and covered by clothes was fully revealed. The muscles here and there have been trained to the limit, and there is no flab at all, making them look even more prominent. The lines of the cut muscles were so sharp that it felt like cutting. Granui swallowed dryly without even realizing it, looking at that figure that could not possibly be seen as someone of the same age. I see. Yes, with a body like that, if you squeeze it, it would be eight times more powerful. Okay. But it would be impossible to go any further than this without using mana. That's the inherent limitation of a guy with poor mana reserves, uh. Granui's words failed to continue this time. Geek. This is because as soon as Vakir came out of the gravity room, he went to the dashboard and adjusted the coefficient of gravity upward. F2 gravity room. Gravity coefficient, 9 times. Current usage time, 0. Whether to use mana, n. Eventually, Bakir returned to the gravity room and began to withstand 9 times the force of gravity. Nonsense. If I do that, I won't be able to last even a minute. Everyone, including Granui, thought the same thing. But Vikir inside was bearing the burden without much thought. Mana is more active in a healthy body. Therefore, in normal times, you should train your pure body without using mana as much as possible. Vikir is still a teenager, so he is short and his muscles and skeleton are not fully formed. So, originally, it would have been impossible to withstand this level of gravity. 
However, the ability to withstand the river sticks for seven minutes as soon as he was born, the harsh training during his childhood, and the strong survival instinct he developed in the water made Vakir a powerhouse that surpassed his weight class. Moreover, the three ghosts of high-ranking monsters trapped within the demon sword Beelzebub were tempering Bakir's body to make it stronger and tougher, and the karma from killing demons so far also became experience points and strengthened the soul. Crunch Clud Clud Screaming sounds were heard from muscles and bones throughout the body, but they recovered immediately due to regenerative power at a level that surpasses that of humans. Muscles repeat tearing, healing, tearing, and healing again, becoming more stretched and tougher. Vikir eventually came out of the gravity room after one hour had passed. Pushyuk. Every time you endure it, you can feel your muscle mass increasing. The students who had been watching from outside as Vikir's gravity room usage time record gradually went up were now looking openly surprised. Wow, look at yourself. I didn't notice it when I got dressed. I think he would be the strongest first-year student if you just look at his physical record without using real mana. What is a first year, I will rub it in with the third year seniors as well. No, maybe even to the graduating seniors. But then what can I do? In the end, it's Manipal. That's right. In the end, if you want to become a high level warrior, the amount of mana is important. The concentration of mana. Regretful. If only he had a good family and received good support, he would be by now. Although everyone admires Vakir's record, there is also an atmosphere of disregard, jealousy, and belittling to some extent. However, the student's gaze is shaken again by Vakir's next action. Geek. F2 gravity room. Gravity coefficient, 10 times. Current usage time, 0. Whether to use mana, n. Vakir has increased gravity again. When Vakir came out of the gravity room, Tudor and Sancho were inside the weight room. Oh my god, Bakir. Did you just survive with 12 times the gravity? Is it possible to do that without raising mana? You're crazy. Even though I hit 1000 on 3, this is impossible. Among his northern peers, there was no warrior who could withstand 12 times the force of gravity with his bare body. What is the secret? And if you set the gravity that high, won't you lose muscle? Bakir just nodded, accepting the towel given by Tudor and the protein supplement given by Sancho. Tudor said with a chuckle. Granui was watching you withstand gravity and ran away ten times. It was refreshing, that unlucky bastard. Bakir, who is not very interested in the evaluation of those around him, just nods his head quietly this time. At that time. Bakir. Is Bakir here? The door to the fitness room burst open and someone came in. It was Bianca who rarely came here. She turned her head and glanced at Vakir among the surprised looking boys. And then I immediately asked. Mosquito. Everyone in the weight room tilts their heads at Bianca's shout. Bianca shouted again. You knew about that mosquito, didn't you? No one could understand why she, who rarely talked to anyone, would suddenly come and say something like this. Even Vikir himself. As Vikir tilted his head, Bianca shouted again as if she was frustrated. And again. You were the one on the rooftop on the day of the new student welcome party, right? That rum smell. Hey, stop and get out. This is the men's section. Why don't you go to the women's section and come here and do this? You're out, because you're not interested. Do you think someone is doing this because they are interested in you? I heard you recently started working part-time at a cafe. Go to your part-time job quickly, Dora. Why do you know that I started working part-time at a cafe, you crazy person? Let's restrain ourselves a bit. I heard that Sinclair started working part-time at a cafe, so I asked and heard that. Tudor stops Bianca and sends her away with a wave of his hand. Meanwhile, Sancho was watching the scene while sharing protein supplements with Vakir. Vakir. Those guys. It suits you quite well, doesn't it? In response to Sancho's question, Bakir tilted his head. No. It looks like we are enemies. Is it? But even though they bicker, they are always very interested in each other. Isn't that because I don't like it? Hmm is it? But I keep having different premonitions. 
Sancho was looking at Tudor and Bianca, who were patting each other with a happy smile. He's a friend with a rather keen sense. Vikir put down the dumbbell he was holding and recalled the memories before his regression. Certainly, Tudor and Bianca become lovers in the future. Their love story, which had always been fighting since they were childhood friends, spread widely on the battlefield and became a topic of conversation that everyone knew about except themselves and that everyone cheered for with one heart. However, after returning, there was no sign of it happening at all, so it was a questionable car, but it seemed like there was something in the eyes of Sancho, who was close to Tudor. But. I don't really have a good feel for this kind of thing. At that time, Bakir was taking out clothes from the cabinet while thinking about various things in his mind. Brr. Bakir, who was putting on his shirt, suddenly felt his left wrist trembling slightly. Madam Baby can be seen sitting on Bakir's wrist, looking up at her with a sullen expression. Nuclear Nucleus. The baby madam was rubbing her stomach with her only two legs, as if she was hungry. It seems that the poison that Granui had sprayed had already been digested. Just be patient. I'll make sure you eat a lot during the midterm practical evaluation tomorrow. Vikir patted Madam Baby's head and said. The midterm exam will begin tomorrow, or in just twelve hours. Before going on a demon hunt, Vikir was making plans for tomorrow. No matter how fake my identity was, since I was a student, exams were important. Episode 179, Midterm Random Defense, 1. It's midterm exam season. There are two exams at Colosio Academy, the final exam and the midterm exam. The final exam consists of sparring between students and basically follows the format of a tournament-style martial arts competition. However, considering the level of students, the concept of tier was introduced, which meant that students of similar level were grouped together to compete. In order to determine the level of the final exam, it is necessary to first verify the student's skills from various angles, and this process was the midterm exam. The midterm exam consists of three major exams. Defense and Attack There is a group test that looks at defense, an individual test that looks at offense, and the other is an ordinary written test. In fact, handwriting did not have a large proportion as it only reflected about 10% of the total score, but defense and attack had a very large proportion as they were reflected in 50% and 40%, respectively. Whether it's a defense test or an attack test, all students must fight against monsters. In this case, the monster is a mud golem created by professors in the thermal weapon department and is a dummy in which only the monster's appearance is covered with a hologram. However, since the professors control these golems by precisely imitating the movements of the monsters, it is almost like a real battle with wild monsters. In the defense test, students enter the stadium in groups of four and, thanks to a huge range of holographic magic, see a scene that makes them feel like they are in a real dungeon or monster field. In this case, spectators watching the game outside the stadium will only see a 100-meter diameter circular stadium. Students participate in the game wearing black tights that cover their entire bodies, and when they receive a certain amount of shock from magic tools, these tights are quantified on a distant instrument panel. Students are given hit points, HP, and this is deducted each time they are hit by monsters. If you are hit hard, a lot of HP will be deducted, and if you are hit weakly, less HP will be deducted. The same goes for hitting a vital spot. If this HP drops to zero, you will automatically be eliminated, so you had to be careful when dealing with monsters. Students entered the dungeon in groups of four and had to defend against an army of monsters that came in like a wave. How long they could survive and defend against this monster wave was the criterion for judging their test scores. For example, this time, Dolores, the third-year student council president, formed a party with three like-minded classmates and went into a virtual reality dungeon. They succeeded in blocking most of the first, second, and third phases against the countless slaughter ants. Did. The time I endured was 20 minutes in phase 1, 20 minutes in phase 2, and 18 minutes in phase 3, for a total of 1 hour. If I had lasted 2 more minutes, I would have received a full score, but even this was quite an achievement as I was able to hold on for the longest time among the 3rd graders. And the 2nd year vice president of the student body formed a group of 4 to deal with the th slaughter ants, and after blocking the 1st and 2nd phases, he was retired at the beginning of the 3rd phase. 
the time taken was 20 minutes for phase 1, 20 minutes for phase 2, and 1 minute for phase 3, for a total of 41 minutes. This was the best record for the second year. Most third graders endured until phase 3 without difficulty, and as expected, most second graders endured until phase 2 without difficulty. And now it was the first graders' turn. A lot of people were gathered next to the stadium. Colosio Academy's midterm and final exams are like a festival for the entire imperial capital that even ordinary people from the suburbs come to see. Sister Dolores. Have a great year again. Cheer up. Colosio. The pride of the imperial capital. Wow, Mage Tower's midterm exam, Varangian's midterm exam, and Themyscira Women's University's midterm exam are all a mess. As expected, Colosio's midterm exam is the best. I'm looking forward to this, National University League, as well. Spectators gather near the stadium in a cloud-like crowd, each calling out the name of the student they are cheering for. Meanwhile, professors, including the principal, were also looking down at the stadium. Among the magic professors in the fever department, there were those who specialized in summoning golems and their sophisticated control. Damn it! A golem made of mud rises. It was a lump of earth with three rough spheres joined together like a head, chest, and stomach, respectively, to form a body, with six legs on each side. Tsutsutsu. This lump of mud was overlaid with hallucination magic. It was nothing more than a lump of crude dirt, but it suddenly took on the shape of a murder ant with a black exoskeleton, sharp jaws, legs, and poisonous stings. As the professors moved their fingers, these murderous ant-like golems crunched around, cracking rocks with their jaws or shooting out stingers at the ground. Every time the fake ant makes the motion of shooting a poisonous needle, a small amount of poison provided by the Monster Research Institute is released, so the battle will be like a real battle. Wow, it really looks like a monster. So, those are all dummies controlled by professors. All you have to do is stop them, right? I'm confident. The first-year students were very excited about their first large-scale exam. Just now, I saw the third- and second-year seniors performing brilliantly, so I was able to enjoy the tour. Soon, a large hologram window appeared in front of the first graders. Map, murderous ant colony, filthy spawning ground. Let's join forces with our colleagues to stop the swarming murderous ants. HP, 100 100. Kill point. Assist point. Point. The full-scale midterm practical evaluation has begun. Piggy was diligently taking notes outside the stadium. Those were the test scores of second and third graders from last time. Since fourth-year graduating classes do not take midterm or final exams, the group with the best test scores is actually third-year students. And among the third graders, the one who held the undisputed first place was Dolores, the student council president. She created a decent party consisting of a supporter in charge of healing and buffs, a defensive mage, an offensive mage, and a mixed mage, and as a result, she showed off her spirit by lasting 58 minutes over three phases. Piggy analyzed the performance data of seniors. Normally, third graders go to phase 3 and second graders go to phase 2. In that case, first graders only have to endure 20 minutes of phase 1. Even if you can only last 10 minutes, you're halfway through. Piggy was strong in the written exam, so much so that he ranked third in the entrance exam, but on the other hand, he was not very confident in the practical skills. And one more thing, Piggy didn't have the connections to form a group. Popular friends formed groups with close friends or with similar interests, but there was no one who needed piggybacking. What do we do? When Piggy was feeling restless inside. Chin. There was a hand reaching out to Piggy to put his arm around his shoulder. Hey, why are you thinking of only going halfway? If I'm going to take the exam, I have to finish it. It was Tudor. Next to him, Sancho is seen standing with his arms crossed. Then Piggy spoke in a crawling voice. It's Tudor. You're so good that you could probably last all 20 minutes because I'm not like that. My practical skills are very poor. So actually, I don't know who to team up with. I wonder if there are kids who include me. What? Article. Tudor, who heard Piggy's words, widened his eyes as if wondering what he was talking about. 
You've already added your name to our group. Uh. What are you doing? So, did you try to group yourself with other kids out of loyalty? As Tudor grinned, Piggy's blank expression turned into tears for an instant. I I am afraid I'll be a nuisance I am weak. Where can you find something like that between friends? Right, Sancho? Well, the obvious thing. And you are smarter than us. Everyone has pros and cons. Tudor and Sancho nodded and said. Piggy quickly takes out a handkerchief and presses it tightly around his eyes. Eventually, Tudor turned his head and looked around. No. But where did he go again? I need to organize it. The goal is to find Vikir. But Vikir was somewhere else, a little further away. At 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 looking for party members at 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 expert senior slash shield warrior at 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 at. We invite two mages fire, poison hashtag 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 current party members, February 4th, hashtag 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 hashtag. Party urgent, I am an expert advanced melee dealer. We will carry you. Let's get someone tang. Expert intermediate or above. Current party member, March 4th. First come first served basis for one healer, female only. Vikir leisurely walks along the outskirts of the playground where numerous signs are lined up. Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy, who spotted Vikir walking across the stadium, walked towards him and shouted with their hands together. Hey! Vikir! Let's go quickly and make a meal. There's not much time left to register. However, similar shouts came from beside them. Brother Vikir. Is there anyone who can take the group test with me? The person waving his hand is none other than Chief Sinclair of the Parade Corps. As if we had become close friends, Bianca was next to us. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy. And Sinclair and Bianca. Divided into groups, they engage in a war of nerves over Vikir. In particular, the conflict between Tudor and Bianca, who were always enemies, was severe. Vikir decided to be in the same group as us. What are you talking about? When I saw him, he had been walking alone ever since. From the looks of it, you guys decided on your own. What are you talking about? Of course Vikir is with us. Because he is our closest friend and we have been together for a long time. I'm sure your hands and feet are the best fit for us, right? What do we do with weak things? He's an archer, so I have chemistry with him. Two archers in one party. You don't even know what's going on in the party. I'm playing. If there are two archers of his level and me, we can easily combine them. After chatting for a while, they soon turned their heads to Vikir. Vikir. Which group will you be in? But. I'm sorry, but I've already decided on the group I'll be in. I have a prior agreement. Vikir's answer was surprising. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair all widened their eyes. This is because since they entered school, they have never seen Vikir go around with anyone else except them. Right then. There were three faces sticking out behind Vikir. Why, what are you complaining about? Are you dissatisfied? Is there any? Three men asking cynical questions to Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair. High bro, middle bro, low bro. They were triplet brothers who were infamous in cold arms circles as the Trident of the Baskervilles. Episode 180 Midterm Random Defense, 2. The Baskerville family triplets appeared out of nowhere and spoke to Bakir in a very overbearing manner. Hey commoner. Follow me quickly. Since it is a group test, we have to get it together in advance. Hybro gestured arrogantly towards Bakir. Bakir quietly carried all of the triplets' luggage. He looked like a porter. And just as I was about to follow Hybro. Wait a minute, Bakir. There was someone blocking the way. It was Don Quixote Tudor. He spoke in a low voice to Bakir. It's not that I'm trying to ignore you, it's that I'm so angry. Can you let me talk to them for a moment? Vikir just stands blankly, not knowing what to say. Tudor, who took this as permission, walked towards Hybro and widened his eyes. And he spoke in a voice so low that only he could hear. Who are you to tell my friend this and that? 
Bikir is not your subordinate. Her. And you carry your luggage. There is no distinction between nobles and commoners within the academy. Beneath Tudor's calm voice, a burning anger was burning. Highbrow looks back at Tudor as if he was dumbfounded. Middlebrow and Lowbrow were also glaring at Tudor from behind. At that time. Right. Vikir is our friend. If you want to hire him as your subordinate, try using us first. Yeah, that's right. How dare you treat Bakir like a servant? The huge Sancho came and stood next to Tudor. And next to him was Piggy with a stern expression. Shake, shake, shake. Although Piggy's legs were shaking mercilessly, he did not take a single step back. It was a completely different attitude from when Piggy was pinned down by Hybro and listened to his help before Vakir returned. Tudor shrugged his shoulders and stepped closer to Hybro. I don't know what your plan is, but don't try to force Vakir to join the team. Because he decided to be in the same group as us. Are these kids crazy? Who said they forced it on whom? Hybro put his hands on his waist as if he was embarrassed. But, as was the case with the Baskerville hounds, Hybro could not hold out for long. SS. Tudor paused at the sharp killing energy emanating from Hybro. Tudor, a member of Class A in the Cold Weapon Donation Department, is currently the overall leader in the Cold Weapon Donation Department, tied for first place with Bianca. However, Hybro of Class B of the Cold Weapons Donation Department ranked third in the overall ranking of the Cold Weapons Donation Department and could not be said to be inferior to Tudor or Bianca. In addition, behind him are Middle Bro, who ranks fourth in the Cold Weapon Donation Rankings, and Low Bro, who ranks fifth. On the other hand, on this side are Tudor, ranked first, Sancho, ranked sixth, and Piggy, who is not ranked. It was an inevitable reality that if we faced each other, we would be outgunned. Will we have a fight? Mash me again. It looks like you think Naphtali is the real battle, right? Don Quixote Tudor and Hive Baskerville stood closely facing each other, baring their teeth. A confrontation between Don Quixote, the spearfishing family, and Baskerville, the iron-blooded sword family. The Empire's spear sword and sharp cold weapon were about to collide with each other. At that time, there were those who joined the side of Tudor, Sancho, and Piggy. Who are you to persecute my brother? It's not a good look to see them all gathered together and growling. What are men? Sinclair and Bianca. When they joined, Tudor's expression brightened. Sinclair and Bianca are chiefs representing the Heat and Cold Arms Division, respectively, so they are a tremendous addition to the force. On the other hand, the expressions of high bro, middle bro, and low bro became even more stiff. Persecution. We just. 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 The triplets seemed angry and tried to open their mouths, but in the end they couldn't and had to close them. Stop. Because Vikir came forward. Vikir said, standing with his back to the Baskerville triplets. I'm not being forced to go. It was really a prior commitment, so we formed a group together. What? Really? Okay. He said he needed my knowledge about monsters and suggested that we form a group first. It already happened a few weeks ago. In that case, there is nothing much to say. Tudor rubbed under his nose as if he was embarrassed. Then he whispered into Vikir's ear. Are you really not being bullied or anything? Does not exist. Are you okay? Okay. So what? If you have any difficulties, please tell me right away. Thanks. When Vikir nodded, Tudor stepped away with an expression of disappointment. Sinclair also wiggles his fingers as if he is disappointed. Brother, are you really in the same group as those people? Okay. Why? Are you close? Depending on. Tudor, Sancho, Piggy, Bianca, and Sinclair all tilted their heads at the same time at Vikir's answer. As far as they know, Bakir has never hung out with the Baskerville triplets since entering school. But how on earth did we become friends? They don't seem very friendly. Aren't you really being bullied? Tudor muttered as if he was worried as he watched Bakir follow along carrying the triplets' luggage like a porter. I am concerned that the weak Bakir might end up in a bad situation. Tudor's prediction was correct. 
Bikir was not very close to the Baskerville triplets. And harassment was actually taking place. Even though the subject and object were reversed. A back alley with few people. Let's do well. When Vikir opened his mouth softly, three answers immediately came out from below. Yes. 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 High bro, middle bro, and low bro answered loudly while lying face down in a resting position with their heads on the floor. Vikir was sitting on high bro's back. You. Vikir looked down at high bro and opened his mouth. High bro, who had his head on the floor and was dripping sweat, flinched as if he heard the Shinigami's name. Sigh. The red face faded and turned white. It feels like the sweat droplets that were seeping out are flowing back into the pores. Even without looking, I could tell that Bakir's eyes were focused on this direction. This is because the back of my head felt cool, as if the tip of an awl was touching me. Bakir asked the question in an emotionless voice. What about a hunting dog that shows its teeth without its owner's permission? It has to be boiled. Highbro answered in a hushed voice. What happens if a hunting dog ignores its owner's words and hangs its prey while hunting? The hunt is bound to fail in all likelihood. For hunters, failure in hunting does not simply mean missing the prey. Hunters can become prey at any time. That is why a hunting dog must always obey its owner's commands. Unless you want to become prey along with your owner. Bikir climbed down from Hybro's trembling back. Weather. 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 As the triplets stood up and repeated their names, Bakir turned his back and spoke. From now on, any fighting that is not permitted by me is prohibited. Even petty arguments. For a lifetime. Yes. 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 High bro, middle bro, and low bro answered loudly. Even though they had been punished, their faces brightened because of what Bakir said last. Throughout my life. What does this mean? He means to take us with him for the rest of our lives. Those who had pledged loyalty to Vakir while in the Baskervilles were now completely reborn as the Trident of Vakir rather than the Trident of the Baskervilles. Wasn't it Vakir who recommended the triplets to Hugo in the first place and allowed them to enter the academy? It's different from the time when I was always worried that I might be abandoned by my family. Dogs that are sure of their owner and are promised that the owner will not abandon them tend to be courageous. Moreover, they had personally witnessed the fight between Madame Eight Legs and Vakir, so they knew to some extent Vakir's true power. I have reached this level at just 18 years old, so what will it be like as I get older? The triplets were sure that their master will one day swallow up the entire Baskerville family. And furthermore, that he will have the whole world under his feet. That is why I can happily and willingly pledge my loyalty to him. Just as it is a dog's blessing to meet a good master, it is a knight's blessing to serve a great master. Meanwhile, Vakir gave a warning to the triplets. I don't really like being noticed by people. I happen to get a little carried away, but I'm not in trouble anymore. The triplets nodded trustingly. We will take care of the midterm exams on our own. I will carry it. I will carry it. This means that if Vakir, who is in charge of the bow, just puts in a good ADC from behind, the triplets will take care of the rest. Vakir hides behind while the triplets are rampaging at the front and passively takes the last hit. Then, you will be able to improve your test scores to a certain extent and it will not go unnoticed. Hybro explained everything about the exam to Vakir. When Group 69 enters the stadium, the virtual reality magic circle will activate. Then the surroundings will become like a dungeon and monsters will come. Although the poison spewed by monsters is diluted, it is real and is dangerous if you allow too much into your body. But don't worry my lord. We will protect it tightly. I know very well. Have you ever practiced before? When my lord was away from the family, I tried it several times at the family training center. It's not a very difficult test, as all you have to do is hold out as long as possible until your HP goes from 100 to 0, because it is a group test, in addition to earning your own kill and assist points, you must also pay some attention to the survival of your teammates. The Baskerville Hounds actually straddle life and death from the moment they are born. These types of virtual reality games are just ridiculous. 
physical damage is not applied until 100 HP drops to 0 HP, and poison damage is applied from the beginning, right? That's right. They say that if a dangerous accident occurs, the instructors disarm the magic firewall and come directly into the stadium to intervene. Since the monster was also a golem created and operated by professors, it was an extremely safe test. The kills are good and the assists are good, so go wild to your heart's content. So I don't have to move. The three brothers, high bro, middle bro, and low bro, grinned at Vakir's words. It was like watching three puppies whose owner told them they could run around and play freely. Yet. Beep. Along with the sound of the whistle, a sound is heard calling for the group to take the next test. First grade article 69. For first year group 69 students, please come up to the stadium now. The skill evaluation of first year freshmen begins now.